Hello everyone, welcome to another episode at the CEO Club. Today I have two very special guests that have travelled all the way from London. Thank you for visiting up north. Uh, we've got Rav and Cooks from Mr. Sings. I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Rav uh, from Mr. Sings and we run a chilli crisp company. Uh, yeah, I'm Cooks. Same business, Mr. Sings. Uh, we're brothers. I I'm the older brother. Rav's the middle brother. We've got a younger brother called Butch. Suki. But we call him Butch. He's, Suki, okay. Yeah, he's out he's in Dubai. He's chilling he in Dubai. Dubai right now. Uh, okay. so, Is he uh, living out there in Dubai? He's living out there. moved out there in September. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, yeah, like my brother said, we run our family business that started from a garden shed. Hey, I'm looking forward to diving into your story. You've had an interesting journey so far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Sings, as you can see, the, it's the crisp business at the moment, uh, but there's a whole story behind it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. let's, uh, let's dive in. It's going to be an interesting one. So like I do with all my guests, I like to start off right from the beginning, talk a little bit about your childhood, what it was like growing up. So Talk to me about uh, what it was like uh, for you to grow up. Was it London that you were both born? Yeah, yeah so we, we grew up in East London. Uh, but to tell the truth, you know, you, correct me if I'm wrong on anything, Rav. Like, we, we actually grew up with, like, so much love and abundance around us. Like, we, you know, we've got a big extended family. My dad's got five brothers uh, and, and a sister. Same on my mum's side. So, like, 20-odd first cousins like you, you must know what it's like right it's just it chaos enormous. chaos growing up in a really really fun way um at the same time the area that we grew up in in east london at that time was a very rough area so you know we were not allowed to play out in the streets and my mum wouldn't let us go out anywhere we couldn't go out with our friends anywhere like i had to be the pioneer like when you know try and go to my friend's house try and go here there anywhere it was always just stay at home i grew up just playing football on the street man yeah, out on Sippy. the streets playing football with my mates, just messing around on the streets. So, what was dangerous about it? Like, why didn't they want you to go out? Yeah. I was about, I remember in the park with two of my mates, we used to play football in Fourth Avenue all the time, and people were just getting robbed there constantly. And we were only yeah. like 12, 13. And people Even younger, just, I think you guys were younger. Yeah. Like, so nine. young kids robbing young kids, basically. I know them boys were much older than us, they would have been in there. Must, must have been in their teens. Teens, 20s. Yeah, like, yeah, like you know, kids. like street robberies. There were drug dealers. Um, you know, there was, you could, you know, there were stories always floating around. Someone jumped into someone's garden and they broke into the house, and uh, you know, it it fills you with like fear, right, to be in that type of environment. And so that's kind of the environment that we grew up in. Still, like, there's other places, obviously, that are way worse than that. And we were lucky to even be like born and raised in that type of area when you look around look at what's going on in the world and what the world is like in general but still for us that was the environment that we grew up in i mean i still remember like back in the days in the summer holidays my mum had to go to work my dad had to go to work so i'd be left in charge to look after my, bro <laughs> my brother my brothers at some point as well and you know like we i'd kind of game the system my mum would call home and she'd want to speak to me if right. he picked up the phone and I wasn't there. So before mobiles, bells. before mobiles, though, we had oh, to go get the house phone. Yeah, yeah, the house phone. Yeah. So when we were bored at home, we'd like I'd say to him like, go and rent a game or rent a film from from the shop. And so I <laughs> it used to sounds, be like like blockbusters, it's like, like a, a DVDs, videos. Yeah, you could yeah, like rent yeah, games. Yeah. He used to sellotape mm. knives to my ankle. <laughs> and just say go and get a game yeah, stay shop. safe if anyone comes do this to them shank them just yeah like <laughs> don't let anyone take anything from you just keep yourself safe and then i'd be like oh my god like i've sent this guy out so that we can be entertained for the day <laughs> and uh you know wait know. for the mum my mum's phone call to come because it always came yeah where's Ra where's rav where's ravi oh you know he's uh I'm he's in the toilet he's ways. in he's in the garden okay everything's okay yeah good fine and then he'd come home and we'd like just piss around for the rest of the day uh, and that was normal for you to just sell it up a knife around yeah, his ankle. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy thinking <laughs> yeah. about it. My son's nine and I was just thinking, like, imagine doing that to my son. Like, it's just mad, like the stupid stuff we used to do. Man. Yeah. yeah. Was it just a mindset that it was a normal thing to do at that moment? I, I think so. Like, our, you know, you, you grow up, your friends are in that same environment and, you know, you'd, you'd see fights that people would, you know, start on you and things like that. Um, and so you just kind of grow up in that environment and so you don't really know any different and in, you know even my mum sent us to a school an hour away from where we grew up um, and you know when we went to school I'm four years older than Rav and there were seven Asian kids in our year I was 
like lurch i was the massive one so i got picked on it was like racism for four five you know three four years straight um right. that we had to deal with so i had to like ha get into fights every week i'd get jumped stand up for myself and then come back home so i'm trying to look after my brothers as well now uh and so you just kind of grow up with that around you all the time and it becomes normal and so you have fear you have scarcity you feel vulnerable you don't feel protected and well, you don't know any different yeah what kind of impact do you think that had on you as uh, children then well look I, I first of all I, I don't blame my parents for anything yeah. uh, you know it, they everyone's parents do the best that they can do whether it's good or bad is another thing but you know it it's made us into who we are today is is shaped us it's given us resilience it's given us a lot also i mean we talk about this a lot that there's so much that we had to unlearn as as men as humans uh about wealth and about abundance and about relationships you have to unlearn so much because of the environment and how it shapes you and how that can really hold you back and uh i don't know about you but i remember for me actually a huge blessing in disguise from my mum sending me to school an hour away from where we grew up my best friends like one's uh he's, he's half english half turkish the other guy's an italian entrepreneurial <clears throat> families you know they've got they had money they were just different mindset people and they're my best friends and through them i got a job in west london in a place called kensington so it's a royal borough of chelsea and kensington now this is one of the richest boroughs richest areas in the country let alone london so i remember at 16 i got my first job part-time and i used to go from east london to west london and i remember seeing ferraris for the first time bentleys i'd see kids my age and younger talking about because i worked in h m and I, <clears> i'd hear them talking about going on skiing holidays i'd see them coming in and spending their own money i'm like how, <laughs> What's going how on? are you doing this like how and i'd see these houses and i'd look in the estate agent windows and you know a flat's a million pounds i have barely seen a hundred pounds at that <laughs> point in life i'm like this is just i couldn't fathom i couldn't comprehend a million pounds i know it's there i know it exists because i'm seeing it but i couldn't comprehend it and actually there i met uh like a similar soul some uh, one of my friends from south london ollie like big Nigerian guy like full of charisma charming guy kind of like Will Smith like really good looking uh, he had like um, a hustle doing um, ringtones okay. right? so he's making money doing <laughs> yeah. ringtones and he he gave me a book it's like a gateway drug for self-help and self-improvement rich dad poor dad I love that right book, yeah. and that for me was a game changer at 16 the first time I'd read a book uh, outside of school and so that started to open my mind to okay there's a different way of living life but, you know, that is a whole different journey that you have to go on. Uh, and that was how I learned that there's something more than what we grew up with at 16. Yeah. Uh, and you talked about changing that scarcity mindset. Yeah. Would you say you grew up in that kind of mindset then? Was that, did you grow up working class? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, man. Like, my parents worked, like, all the, my mum was at work all the time. My dad was uh, a lecturer at uni. He was doing, he was graphic design lecturer. And then at mm. night he used to go to like the restaurants where he'd he moon, like moonlighting as a chef. like a chef okay. in the evenings. That they was working like that's all we knew. Like you go work, that's and it. You go to work, you turn up, come home. Some weird and wacky way of trying to make money. That like, that's what that's what our dad grew. That's what our experiences were of our dad. Like he'd just try every week, every month. It felt like he was trying something new, doing something different. So he was working and he was also trying to be an entrepreneur as well. Yeah. Yes. That, that's our, that is 100% where we got it from. Yes. Yeah. He kind of saved us, saved us if, if we're being honest. Yeah. Because like, my mum wanted us to be, you know, good Punjabi boys, <laughs> right? Be a doctor, be this, be that, education, be that. And, yeah. yeah, education, sensible. You know, my dad, thankfully, allowed us to be a bit more wild and a bit more creative and explore who we, who were, we were. And I think that's, that made us different um because he's a, he's an artist as well like he loves yeah. to draw and so he's got that little weird side to him as well yeah um that, that's definitely where it come from for, well, for me anyway like yeah. i've always ha i've had jobs and i've just felt like this is not right i don't feel right having a job i was good at jobs i was bad at jobs but just having a job just never felt right for me mm. it, it's weird i was an awful employee I was talk, a, talk about your first jobs then where, where did you start working my first job mate i've had so many jobs 
Like <laughs> my first real proper job that I've had the longest was only five years ago. Oh. I start no no I've just finished it like six months no, ago. But didn't you work in the Crown Prosecution Service at one point? Yeah, I worked at the CPS. I worked oh. as a bus driver. I worked in warehouses. <laughs> uh, I, I was a pharmacy technician at one point. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, your CV must see, be uh, Sainsbury's. Oh, I've been yeah. a van driver. Oh my god, oh, you've yeah. gone through so many different roles and in industries. Then oh, I, just, I just don't like working for people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. And then my my last my first career at 33 years old, I worked uh, at Foxton's, like the biggest estate agent in yeah. London. That I was really good at. I yeah, stayed there for five it, years. Then. I've never had a job for more than a year. That was wicked. Okay, so you're giving your age away there. 38. 38, yeah. yeah man. Okay, so you're 38. You've been uh, in a fair few roles. How about yourself? Uh, so my first job, as I mentioned, was at H&M, like proper in a corporate world job. But you forget, my dad, so he uh, set up one of the first... So my dad's East African. My parents are East African okay. from Kenya. And um, he used to moonlight as a chef doing kind of... Uh, African Indian food so it was always a bit more spicy it was just a little bit different to Indian food and it wasn't obviously African food but it just had a twist to it and people loved his food so he set up one of the first kitchens uh, in a place called Jim Gymkhana um, in, in East London and our first job you I don't know if you remember I didn't this, even add that to my list yeah, yeah. I was we, a waiter. we were waiters okay right we were waiters at my dad's restaurant so that was actually my first job um where we were massively underpaid, but you know, I you wasn't even paid. <laughs> I got paid. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> revealing something there, right? Right, you speak to pops about that one, yeah. But my first proper job was with HM, and then from, from there, I went to like college, did uni for a bit, a couple of part time jobs. Um, I then I worked as a stockbroker actually, I worked in corporate finance for a bit, then I moved to a property company is a really interesting business so this guy he was selling property in that was being built in india but to people outside of india uh so where, where's your family from so pakistan pakistan right yeah. so imagine i don't know like in kashmir there's a new development coming up right yeah. a big development a thousand flats right what this guy would do he'd basically make a deal with the developer and you, you see a lot of it now he'd go to the uk and go you know what give me 200 of these apartments, I will sell them for you, but give me a special price. Okay. So the developer would ag agree the price. This guy would go to the UK and he basically set up an estate agency selling property from India to people in the UK. So I, because I was doing really well in uh, stockbroking and corporate finance, my boy that got me into that world got me into this uh, opportunity here. So initially I came in just doing sales. But then we found that, like with most Asians, there were people that had a lot of money. They wanted deals and they wanted to make investments. I don't want to buy one flat. Give me 10. What's the best deal that you can do for me? I've got 100,000. I've got 200,000. Do a deal for me. So we basically created like the investment division in this company and started putting deals together. Um, and then shortly after that, we spotted an opportunity. And that's when I started my first business with one of my best mates. We uh, created our own development out in uh, Gujarat. I can't speak Gujarati, I could just about speak English, <laughs> right? And uh, we'd go, so we went there, we bought 5.6 acres of land with investors' money, um, and we built a, it was an eight million pound development, basically 152 apartments. And so I was responsible for the brand, mark, the branding, the marketing, and the selling of that company. And we started it almost like a side hustle. So we'd be selling these properties for this company, and then in the evenings, we'd be there till nine, 10 o'clock, calling like, all the Gujaratis in the UK, like I'm trying to learn to speak the language, we're selling, 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 start selling these apartments. And, and then shortly afterwards, I left that company, sorry, left the company that I was employed by, and we went full time into our own business. So then that was my first business. Okay, so that's your first business. Yeah. Uh, what age are you at that point? I was probably 20, like 24. 526 that's an ambitious uh, kind of business to go straight into without yeah. any capital so yeah you're using investor funds so basically my 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 best mate and uh, business partner his father-in-law had been a builder in Gujarat for 35 40 years so it was a safe area in that his father-in-law was there he could source the land he could do all yeah. that you know there's all the local business that 
unless you've ever done business out in India or Pakistan or anywhere, you don't understand how lawless it is. <laughs> right? we're, t- we're taken care of here very well. You go there and it's like the Wild West. But this guy, he, um, you know, his father-in-law, he, he knew the game. So we felt comfortable that we'd secured a parcel of land and we'd basically identified a strong opportunity for this development there's a nice story to it so how well do you know london probably just got canary wharf when i go down so canary (laughs) wharf is part of this story so where canary wharf was back in the days like 30 40 50 years ago it was a dump right it was was nothing it's just wasteland it was brown land yeah yeah, brownfield land it's basically where the docks were 100 years ago right where this country built its wealth and then it got derelict and then some smart guy came along and decided to develop it all and it turned into the big glossy area that you see today. So the area that we identified, we kind of positioned it in the same way. The airport was here, a 10 minute drive, you're in this new area where there's nothing. But there's a massive new development that's just come up and no one else is building residential property there. So we came up with this concept and um, I remember it, my stake was £5,000. I didn't have £5,000. I, I just about had uh, £1,200. And I asked my two uncles to lend me the other money. So I bought 20% stake in that company with basically £1,200. And the rest I borrowed from my uncles. And uh, yeah, so then we, we basically launched this, this scheme, this development. And I remember we, we designed the layout on uh, an on an envelope in a bar we we're like this is what it's going to look like and oh, uh, <laughs> yeah so we came up with the name called it hati hati group hati group what does that mean uh, elephant okay so the, the elephant holds great significance you know when you look into the uh the entomology and the meaning of what an elephant means uh there's a lot of like it's connected connected to royalty to stability to so many different things so we named it after that and uh launched the brand launched the, the 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 project from there and started selling started selling so how did that go then so i um about t- two years into that project i we'd launched mr sings right so this is the introduction uh, of mr sings yeah so we'd launched mr sings and so it got to a point i had to i had to take a call now do i do mr sings or do i carry on with this business um and so i decided to sell out of that business sold my stake to my partners Luckily, I took two apartments in as part of my payment and uh, then went all in with the family business. Right. So let's talk about Mr. Singh's. Uh, so how did Mr. Singh start? What is it about for listeners that might not have heard of the brand? What is Mr. Singh's? So Mr. Singh's is a family run now chili crisp company. We make all natural vegan chili crisps uh, made in the UK um, and using that, using our dad's and our uh, dad's recipes. But I actually started... A long, long time before that. Like in the 80s. The original yeah, pretty much in idea. the 80s or something. So my whole life growing up, it's always been like barbecues. My birthday's in June. So my birthday Parties. every every year has been a barbecue at home. Yeah, love like, that. That's all I can ever remember my birthdays being. And um, my dad's sauce that he created was was the main thing. Like we'd have, like my brother was saying, we had extended family, all my uncles over, cousins, mates. I remember my 21st, at one oh. point, there was like people in the front of my, the front garden, in the house. And we didn't have a big house. Like in just the garden, spilling out people into every everywhere. Corner. And like barbecued music. The best. Mates, drinks, just a good time. And and my dad's sauces, like they were, he'd be on the barbecue making kebabs or tandoori chicken, whatever it was. But yeah, boom, chili sauce, chili sauce all the time. And he's made this sauce as long as I can remember, isn't it? Yeah, Pretty yeah. Much. yeah. And then obviously at Jimmy's as well, right? <clears throat> yeah, when he had that, when he had the restaurant we were talking about earlier, what he used mm. to do is just put it in containers and give it to people because everyone was like, "This sauce is amazing!" Like, because he, he he made it because he was trying loads of chi- like he loves chili, like he has chili on <laughs> everything. He's got problems, man. <laughs> Seriously, like <laughs> the he amount coughs, of chili, he, yeah. he's like, like he's like eyes are watering, but he just eats he more. Eat he it. loves it, man. He, he just yeah. he absolutely loves, loves it. So funny. Um, but yeah, so he basically tried like all the other sauces that were out there he found some were like too sweet or this one's not hot enough too vinegary too vinegary whatever and then he basically made his own and then used to sell that at his restaurant not sell it just give it as a side chutney when you get your food yeah he used to just give it away and people are can have some sauce in a tub used to fill up the big tupperware containers 
I just give it to people and people are like, oh, how much? He goes, I don't want money here, just take it. Like, that's what you do. You're Indian, then you just give stuff to people. <laughs> um, and that that's basically where the source started. And then... And then it's someone, people used to tell him to bottle it because a lot of the people that came to that restaurant, they were like shopkeepers. Oh, they were shopkeepers, that's it, yeah. And they used to tell him to bottle the sauce. And so he went away and he learned how to bot- bottle the sauce. Like you have to get all the nutritional information and things like that, the labeling, etc. So he bottled it uh, and he couldn't think of a name. He didn't know what to call the sauce. And um, We only found this out the other day yeah. that my uncle gave him the name my youngest he, he was, uncle, like he, he was thinking of what should I call this sauce? What should I call it? And yeah, my youngest uncle basically said you should call it Mister Singh. Yeah, and we didn't know that. I mean, he unfortunately passed away uh, two years ago now, mm-hmm. right? So he's a young, he's like the baby of the family, and like he passed away. Yeah, he's like, he's only fifty like. something. Like he's a young guy, and when my dad told us, we're like, oh my god, Church. Like he's Tom, we call him. Tom. He's like he looked like a Greek god, right? This guy, yeah. and, but he, and he named the sauce, uh, the the, 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 the chili company, sauce. Yeah. Is that the family name, Mr. So Mr. Singh? Singh yes, yeah, so we're Singhs, right? Okay. I'm supposed to have a turban. I can't grow a beard properly, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like we're, we're Mr. Singh. So my dad wears a turban, and he goes to my dad, like, Budge, you should call it Mr. Singhs. So my dad loved the name, took it, put that on the label, um, and then you know the blue bag story, right? So I remember. So growing up, we my dad would always um, just do weird things, like try and make money, try try something new, That's which awesome. rubbed off on us. And I remember one time we woke up and there was a food truck outside of our house <laughs> and there's a wire going up the tree and into his bedroom. <laughs> and we're like, like my whole childhood, my front living room window from all there you could see was this white kebab trailer. truck. Like, what is this? Chakula Express. Is what Chakula it, Express. Yeah, yeah, in Swahili, that uh, what's it mean? Food or yeah, eating like or eating. something? Like I think Chakula means, means eating in Swahili because the, the Africans, right? My yeah. dad, my family. Uh, so anyway, this massive food truck is outside. So we grew up with weird stuff like this all the time. And he'd come home one day soaking wet because it was raining outside and he had this those cheap blue plastic bags. So before you get to that, that Chakula Express thing. So two really good memories I have of it is when I went learned to ride a bike. So I must have been five, six years old or something. You come out my house and they've got little step down and it goes onto the pavement. Yeah. Coming down this yellow step and going straight into this trailer, like face first, because oh, it was <laughs> no way. So out, boom, and I hit it. And then we used to go around the country. We used to go like South End and random places. And my dad used to set up this trailer, make kebabs and sell them like like we were at a circus or something like that like we travel around and he'd have his chili sauce with him make kebabs and we used to sell stuff and i remember being little like taking my skateboard and just playing while he was doing that i love that so he's got a real entrepreneurial <coughs> spirit about him yeah 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 yeah. need to get him on some time yeah. next <laughs> awful businessman but he's a yeah he's a fantastic uh creative type of person okay. um but yeah, yeah the blue bag yeah. yeah so oh yeah so he you know He'd come in soaking wet from the rain. You know the the Indian shops, they give you these, the Asian shops, like cheap, cheap, cheap blue plastic bags, awful for the environment. So he'd walk in with one of those and we're like, Pops, what are you doing now? What next adventure have you gone on, right? And he goes, oh, I've been out trying to sell my chili sauce. <laughs> we're like, okay, fine. And then for some reason, I think a week later, I saw an advert for, uh, it's called the BBC Good Food Show. Now this is a big food event food show held in kensington olympia in in london 30 40 000 people over the course of a weekend they come to this show and they just sample food from all over the country and um they were looking for exhibitors and i remember my, my mate saying to me look you know do something with your sauce book a stand here and i looked at it and i was like okay why not and it was a uh, i remember it was 900 pounds and you know we grew up and 900 pounds is a lot of money, right? It was a lot of money to us. I'm like, where am I going to get that from? So I booked it on my credit card, booked the stand, came home and I told the family, I said, guys, I booked a stand at the BBC Good Food Show. Uh, I paid 900 pounds on my credit card and these guys are losing. I remember thinking like, oh my days, my brother's got 900 pounds. <laughs> like, this is sick. It's a lot of money. But it's just yeah. serious. I was like 21. But that was a mindset, right? That, that's what we grew up with. Like, that's that was 20, a lot of money 21 years old. Like 900 pounds to me is like. Might as well be a million, mate, right? Like 1,000 pounds. Oh, my days. <laughs> you think of it now, it's like, uh, okay, whatever. It's only. But anyway, the, the 
you know, booked the 900 pounds on my credit card, came home, told the family, I said, look, guys, we need to make a thousand bottles of chili sauce so I can pay off my credit card and uh, we're going to sell each bottle of chili sauce for two pounds. So we then spent the following week, because that's when the show was, <clears throat> learning how to make my dad's chili sauce. Now He, he had no idea yeah. how to make his own sauce. He knew how to make it. But, but there's no recipe, one. no process, nothing. It was all like... A uh, bit of this, bit of that. Uh, put this in, uh, blah, blah, do this, do and this. And all this was consistent. Oh. Yeah, yeah, always yeah. consistent. Because he'd be like, needs this. He's got some magic palette, <laughs> right? His uh, <laughs> flavor profile is insane. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he we had to learn how to make it. We had to learn the process, write it all down. The girls were like so organized and they, they made, made it all happen. But I remember we destroyed my mum's kitchen right trying to make this chili sauce and this you know splashes on the ceiling and we, we had to so this sauce we had to hot boil it you know to make it safe you have to boil it and then bottle it boiling hot and then seal it and that kills all the germs and it makes it last for like years and the f the first day of the show was a friday and um we drove from east to west london it takes an hour at that time, it's two hours now, but it took an hour to drive there. We had to set up the stand. And we'd never done any of this before, bear in mind. We didn't know what any of this meant. So just so before you get there, like making the sauce, he, he would make enough for us guys and family, maybe enough for 20, 30 people. We were now trying to make a thousand bottles. So that's not a handful of two kilos of chilies. We had to go, me and my dad went, I think one o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at night, Spitterfields Market in East London and bought, I think it was like 50 kgs, 100 kgs of chilies. Bird's eye red chilies, yeah. Bird's eye red chilies, brought them home and floor to ceiling was boxes of chilies and they had stalks on them. We had oh, to yeah, hand yeah, yeah, pick yeah, yeah. the stalks hand pick off the of stalks. hundreds of thousands of chilies. And then wash them in the bathtub. Wash them in the bathtub, no. take them, yeah. in, and we had just regular blenders. The blend, we went through so many blenders because we kept blowing the motors on them. The motors yeah. just kept burning out because we were using them so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like a real home operation. Mate, I'm telling you, like... Operations um, are very, uh, you know... Loose work. That's a, that, that's a, that's a very complimentary <laughs> word. This yeah. wasn't an operation. This was like figuring it out as we went along, okay, literally. Even like down the side of the sofa years later, you'd oh, still yeah. find stalks <laughs> of chilli. We'd, we'd watch football. We'd put a bucket in the middle of the living room We'd pick chilies, like my younger brother, me, my brother, my wife, my sister-in-law, my mum, my dad. And we'd pick chilies and just throw them into this bucket and just watch football or watch something like that for hours. That bucket was full. That goes in for a wash in the bathtub. And then the next. And then gets yeah, that was the week. That was the first week making the sauce. So, And then when we, we got to the event, these boxes, they were like 35 kilos each, right? So my younger brother and me, we had to hold these boxes up four flights of stairs to the top level where we had our stand, set up our stand finally, the show's opened. I'll never forget this, you you weren't there. <coughs> and you know, we had like chilies and our products ready to sample. And I saw this old lady walking towards me, right? She had purple hair, like just wobbling along like this. I'm like, please, please don't stop here. This is gonna kill you yeah, if this you try gonna to blow your head off. It's, it's too blow, hot for you. You're gonna it's too like hot for you. we're gonna get sued or something please don't stop at my stand please don't and she's walking over and she's like looking at us i'm like it's gonna it's gonna happen in it it's gonna happen she's gonna stop and she walks over and she stops she's like what do you have here and i was like well it's actually you know, what is it and so i just told our story i said it's a it's a chili sauce my dad made it up we made it at home this week and i just we just told the truth that like, this is who we are we didn't try and make anything up and she goes okay um i'm gonna try some and i'm trying to warn her now i'm like listen babes please don't it's gonna blow your head off and she tries it and she's like oh that's oh that's really hot that is that's really hot and i'm like look you know i, I did try and tell you have some water and she goes oh my, my son will love that and she gave us money and she bought it. she bought a bottle her first customer and she walked off and i just remember looking at my brother going i can't believe someone's paid us for something that we made and, these and it was someone like that. Yeah, I thought it was just going to be like Asians, but it was white people, black people, like Chinese, Asian, everyone. It didn't matter. Like it didn't everyone matter. Everyone loved the product. By the end of the weekend, we'd sold out. And I remember being at home. Do you remember this? In the living room, like we're counting all the money. And like, we've got enough to pay off the credit card. Yeah. You know, we can we maybe order some McDonald's tonight as well. 
and and that was how the business was born we're like we've actually got something here we could do something with this if we want to we were doing these shows then they started becoming regular let's do another show let's do another mm. show for there years was, there was it? one we did it was a week long i think it was called the vitality show or something like that and it, that one was a seven day show or a five day show again handmade the bottles took them to the show set up done all that and by day three we had sold out and we were like we've got nothing we've got no nothing left so during that day we had to start hand making more oh yeah for the next yeah, yeah, yeah. day wow. we were selling them in the morning because we just finished making them at like 3 a.m and we were back in the place by nine so mm. you'd have to be there at eight leave home at seven to set up and these bottles were still burning hot so we'd literally finished them like four hours ago and everyone had jobs as well so we sold at, as we're selling out of these ones half of the family is still at home making more for Friday and Sat and Saturday's going to be the busy day That's and we sold out every single day wow and we did this for years and not just big shows we were doing food shows farmers markets anything we could lay our hands anywhere on anywhere that we could get to we, my mum used to have a Peugeot 206 so it used to be three of us in there and so much chilli sauce in the back the car was like this we broke the suspension of that car in the end because <laughs> it was just full of chilli sauce all the time so you're doing really well the business is now selling out every every event you go to what happens then then how come uh, i'm sure the listeners are going to be asking how come there's no uh, none of that sauce on the table at the moment um well look to tell the truth we did um we did sauce for for years maybe six years seven years like we did these food shows for at least four years or so i would say probably more than that maybe man. five years uh, we started to get picked up by a couple of smaller retailers, like bloggers were writing about us. And actually, the sauce was a key part of it because there was no real proper chili sauce out there at the time uh, that was consistent like ours was. Uh, and our story, the fact that it's this like mad family from East London making chili sauce. I, we only had one product, right? And so... Oh, sorry, but it is a mad family from East London making the sauce, I'll tell you. So how we used to make it. So it started off in the kitchen, in the bathtub, Oh, yeah. Then basically, we just couldn't do it. In, like our kitchen was tiny, like three the size people. of this sofa. Yeah, no three people. Like it was this way, right. like three or four people in the kitchen max, and there was seven of us. So basically, our garden shed. We had to gut it. We got the health and safety people over, and they said, "Oh, you need a water supply. You need this, this, this." Basically, took everything, just put it in the garden, put some shelves up, like that, and then. Called the health and safety people. They're like, yep, yeah, that's perfect. You can use that to make sauce. Proper production line. Wicked. So me and my wife had just got married at this time now. <laughs> yeah. But we set up like this production line. Okay, cool. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. It's going to work like this. So we'd have gas burners chained to the shed because that's what we had to do. I mean, it was hot in there. like, And this sauce was bubbling like a cauldron. So my wife on the left... my she would sterilize the bottles oh, yeah, by yeah, hand yeah, yeah, yeah. in boiling water she'd sterilize bottles and pass it on to me and cook's wife so me and my sister-in-law would be here we'd fill the bottles by hand we'd put them there cooks would put the lid on turn it no no my mum would put the lid on turn it sideways he'd put one label on flip it my younger brother put the other label on my dad would put the heat seal on and then put it in the box when that box was empty my dad would say box is empty one of us would take it in the living room. So we full, had a proper... Full. Yeah, once the box was full. Like a proper production, proper production line, line yeah, going on. But the, the jokes we had in that shed, like that's probably what made it for me. It was so much fun. Like, I was with my brothers, my mate, like just having jokes. There was like... So my hands, I used to wear marigolds with boiling hot chilli sauce, right? So I, I was there. So my wife's there, me, my sister-in-law, <laughs> my mum, him and my younger brother once. I'll never forget this. I'm pouring chilli sauce. Yeah. boiling hot and they pull my pants down <laughs> in the shed and my <laughs> sister-in-law my wife my mum's there I'm standing there what are you doing man what are you doing they're you pissing go. themselves laughing <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh because I'm like in danger basically <laughs> like that. I take my gloves I put my pants back on like what are you doing man but it was so much fun like we had so much jokes in that shed I think it saved our family you know yeah, I think that's it. That that whole experience bonded and saved saved our family. So I remember I was watch, I was listening to a podcast, I watched one, sorry, with Jay Shetty a couple of months <coughs> ago, and he says that there's four uh, type four layers to relationships. He said the first layer is what most people do is where they um, 
they just experience something. So let's say, for example, they go to work, they come home, they watch TV. Yeah. Right. They're just experiencing uh, watching TV together. And, and that's it. The second layer up is that you um, learn something together. Right. So if we're learning something together, um, then our relationship becomes a bit stronger and the bonds a little bit stronger. The third layer up is it if you create something together. Right. So we're creating this conversation. Right. We were creating in the shed this product. So that makes you even stronger still. And the fourth uh, layer of this, the strongest way to build a relationship is to serve others. Right. So we were serving others with our products. We were, you know, serving each other, looking after each other. And so we were doing all four of those things without knowing it. And it bonded our family because at the time, like he said, he just got married. Uh, I wasn't living at home. I'd moved out. My youngest brother, I think he was like either at college or he was doing his own thing. My dad was out doing his own thing. My mom was working. And, you know, you see it happening all the time. Like people, as they start to grow into their own lives, you know, siblings start to separate and they start living their own lives and you're no longer bonded. And we were on that path. But I think that whole experience, it changed the trajectory for all of our family in like so many different ways, but it bonded us massively. Um, and I, I think that's what, drove us to carry on doing what we were doing because we were having those experiences and we could see this leading somewhere and so going back to your original question about well why is there crisps on the table now not sauce um was because that over a period of years the brand and our story seemed to resonate with more and more people so we were starting to sell more we eventually got listed with um selfridges with harvey nichols with ocado we were in tesco we were in sainsbury's uh, uh, Morrison's mm, oil and uh, vinegar. As the oil, there was a chain of stores called Oil and Vinegar Stores. Um, I remember mm. my my brother, my younger brother, my dad, and me. In I think four months, we went door to door selling, and we managed to go from zero to six hundred independent retailers, butcher shops, uh, grocery stores, sandwich shops, door to door selling every week. So we built up our own distribution um, and. You know, I'd brought investors into the company as well uh, in 2012 uh, because I had funded everything myself up until that point. And, um, you know, so we were we were really doing a lot to grow the business, to grow the brand. The challenge was that we were still not really building a business. You know, we were just still trying to figure it out as we were going along. Still had like, I'd actually left by that time. Rav had left. But everyone still had jobs. And so, you know, we were packing pallets of stock that we were sending to the supermarkets on our terrace street in East London. You know, massive lorries coming down our road, dumping stock on our street. We had to take it by hand into our house, drop it into our cellar for storage. And then as we were selling it, rebuild pallets outside of our house so no, lorries no, could come along yeah. and collect it no forklifts or anything no we forklifts or anything articulate stopping on the street opening that side and we didn't have forklifts or they didn't bring forklifts yeah, so how would they get it on the well, they put it they put it on there so, no but get, at first get remember others. they we had to um they had a spare pallet so what we had to do was open the pallet that we'd made on the street and handball oh, each case no on so that i think there was 140 cases on each pallet uh, and so we had to handball cases onto the pallet in the truck, and wrap it in the truck. We caused a you know, 30 minute delay on our road. Ouch, People yeah. are pissed. But, you know, we were like, we can't carry on like this. Mm. And um, I remember early doors, this distribution company had contacted us, but it wouldn't price wise. It wouldn't work out at the time. But we spoke to them again and, you know, they were now it started to look interesting because we had margin in there that we could afford to give them and they had 2000 independent stores that they had access to they had trucks they had hundreds of employees they had everything in place plus they had uh, relationships with all the buyers at the supermarkets now bear in mind it took me a year and a half to get tesco it took me nearly nine months to get asda uh, sorry uh, sainsbury's you know off my own back like through my own hustle to try and find these buyers and get them on board and these guys could just walk in and have conversations with them. So the deal was that they were going to take our business from where it was to seven figures plus, which we were on the path of doing. 
but it would have taken us far, far longer. And so the deal was that they grow the sales side, we grow our marketing. Because our social media at the time was only, I think, three or 4,000 followers. But in that one year that we were worked with the distributor, a lot of it to do with the genius of this guy, like we managed to get our social media up to about 60,000 in a year, 70,000 in a year. Um, the downside was that I have to take ownership of this. I took my eye off the ball when it came to sales. I took my eye off the ball when it came to the listings with the big retailers and the independent guys. Because when it's our product, I'm going in and I'm speaking to the buyer and I'm passionate, I'm excited. I'm gonna do everything in my power to convince this guy to not only list my product, but give me more stores, give me the best price, let's do deals together, let's sell Mr. Sings. Well, I'm passionate, I'm excited about it. The distributor, when they're going in, I'm part of a 50 page catalog. I'm like a one little quarter section. So when he's speaking to the buyer, he's like, look, here's something for you. Oh, here's something new that we've got, might be of interest to you. They don't really care about how the performance is of that product and they can delist it, they'll put something else, else in. Um, and because I took my eye off the ball, everything that we'd built up over those years, we lost within six months. It was how gone. did you lose it then? It was the the sales just started to go down and I wasn't looking at the, the data enough. Okay. It was their job. So in my mind, at, looking back in hindsight, I was, I kind of blamed them. I was like, this is your job. You should, and it is. Yeah, we signed the contract for that. That's what they were uh, agreed to do in writing is to grow our sales. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I have to take ownership, accountability, be responsible for my own business. And uh, it didn't happen. So with the supermarkets, they don't care. That little bit of shelf space that they've given you is like renting a property that has to be making money has to bring in rent every month. Yeah. But for them, it's every week. It's got to be bringing in rent. And if your product stops selling or the sales start going down, they'll get rid of you and put something else there. So that's what happened. And during that same year, because we were on such a high trajectory, we decided to do a crowdfunding campaign to raise more money for the business so we could scale more. And uh, we used a platform called Cedars. We wanted to raise £95,000. I think we pre-funding we'd probably secured 70 percent of that already the day we opened within 24 hours we'd hit our target and then i think four or five days later we'd we'd raise 125,000 pounds so i closed the campaign so it's funny you know we get all this money and then two weeks later we've lost everything in terms of all of our listings and remember we were sitting around the the dinner table and i said to him and i said to my dad we're effed what do we do? How do we play it now? We've, do we give all this money back to the investors and shut the company down? Do we try the source again? What do we do? So we talked about it and I, you know, I had this idea for a long time to do snacks, you know, move into crisps, Mr. Sings, the flavor profile, especially of the red one, the chili, lemon and cracked salt. It's, uh, it's a flavor that my, my parents grew up with in Kenya. Cause they do, you know, cassava chips. It's called, yeah. it's called Mogo. Mogo. Yeah. You know, Mogo, right? So they do this uh, chili, lemon and cracked salt in Kenya. Uh, it's like a normal, like so a peri it's peri. It's like a regular snack. There's more good. It's just a yeah. That's thing. what, and we grew up with that eating that flavor, and we always said this on a crisp would be legendary. It was just something we said. Oh, imagine this on crisps. Like we've always said. Oh, this would be banging on crisps. So you then and so the the decision. Oh, well, hang on, no one puts this on crisps. Yeah, why not? Why not? No. And the the other part of it was that I'd learned some new things about business. So there's something called. Um, Positive cash flow, neutral cash flow, negative cash flow. So what does that mean? That means a negative cash flow model was what we had with the sources. That meant that in on the 1st of January, let's say I'm making 20,000 bottles of sauce, I'm going to put, it's going to cost me 15 grand. I have to now wait four weeks for my product to be made uh, and then another week for it to be delivered, let's say. So five weeks, I've paid out 15K. I've not had any money come in. That stock arrives. I now have to sell that stock, right? So maybe I've made five, five pallets, let's say. One pallet's going to go to Sainsbury's. One pallet's going to go to Tesco. One pallet's going to go here. The other three pallets, we have to sell one by one. Now, some of these people have got 60-day payment terms, 90-day payment terms. Other people are paying me cash. So it could be that that £15,000 that I've spent in uh, January, I might not get that money back for six months. But in that six-month period, I have to pay wages. I have to make more stock. I have to do more advertising. So it's a very cash flow intensive business. 
to to run and unless you've got a lot of cash flow and that's why we kept running out of money um well eventually we stopped running out of money because i learned that it was a negative cash flow model and we learned how to manage cash flow better um it's it's a difficult business to run and very cash intensive and so crisps on the other hand was completely different it's a cash flow positive model what does that mean that means that i can actually sell my product and get paid for it up front uh, to my customers let's say online or my trade customers they will wait for the delivery to come I can get my stock made the same week and I've got 30 day payment terms with my supplier. So I'm getting my money up front and I can pay them in 30 days. So it's way better for cash flow. So what makes people want to pay up front for this, but not for the sauce bottles? Is that just the way the market is? Um, well, I mean, for example, we could sell our product into, let's say, a pub. Yeah. And we say, look, uh, you'll get your delivery in two weeks. And they say, fine, they'll send me the invoice, they'll pay for it because they've sampled it, they know it's good. Okay. So they'll, they'll do it that way, they'll order in advance. Uh, even when we were selling online, not like we were selling in COVID, but even when we were selling online, people would pay for it and they'd expect the delivery a week later, let's say. Yeah. So we know that, okay, orders come in, we've already sold it, we don't need to worry about if we're gonna sell the stock once we buy it in. Yeah, it's all pre-sold, right? So it's great cash flow. Plus, the other positive we felt that the crisps had over the sauces was, how long do you think it's going to take for someone to use a bottle of chili sauce? An average family, average person. For like three months? Exactly. Three months, one bottle of chili sauce. I want to be selling one bottle of chili sauce every day. It doesn't quite work like that. Again, it's very challenging on cash flow. Crisps, how quickly is someone going to buy a packet <laughs> yeah. of crisps? Yeah, you can go Indeed. through a fair few of them, yeah. In, in one sitting. Then. Yeah. In one sitting, you'll go through 10 bags as a family. There's a lot more benefits. Right, it's, a, it's lower uh, lower margins, lower, let's say, per product profit. You might only make 20, 30 pence, but the volumes are significantly harder, uh, higher, sorry, and, and much improved cash flow. Another really annoying thing about the sources was the amount of breakages. Oh, God, yeah. Glass bottles... Yeah. Are you trying to send glass anywhere, man? Like deliveries into shops. Oh, half your pallet's broken. Oh, or you get people man, come call in. Oh, I've got my delivery. This it's all busted. Like, and you have to do, pay for their cleaning. You have to pay pay for replacement. It's a bit of a nightmare. What was the supplier situation like? Getting the glass bottles. Then did you manage to source them quite well? Or well, at, at the beginning we were getting them fine. Like we had a supplier in London. We in, in London. South London. So yeah, Bermondsey. We used to drive down to Bermondsey and. To pick up bottles yeah then cooks found a and a cheaper alternative <laughs> that doesn't in, sound in good china. in china china but um, we got the, he got he got the samples to be fair and the sample was good it was stunning a, it was a nice bottle it was stunning it was like it was right it was a nice bottle nice nice lid. red lid like the red matched our turban we we're like oh, this is sick and then went went all in on it innit? and bought um <laughs> a 40 foot container worth wow in yes. one go yeah. it just just from so from China to Manor Park, because basically it would say you know we'd make more profit. You know the bottles we were buy buying from South London, thirty five pence per unit. This bottle from China came in at nine point six pence per unit, including the cap, including everything. So yeah, it's the profit is massive. If you look at percentage terms, like, okay, good. it's mm. big percentages, but the quality needs to be no, there. So basically, this articulated <laughs> lorry comes down the road again. And we're like, oh my god. It was just days. you by yourself. The same so everyone's, yeah, yeah. everyone's at work. I was the only one home. <laughs> and I'm like, As you, there's no forklift. So like, no, you didn't order a forklift. Uh, so Cooks was trying to save a bit of money. Yeah. And again, this is like growing up. Scared right? your mindset, yeah, yeah. right? Just scared to spend an extra hundred quid on getting a forklift. So I've hand taken off thousands of boxes onto the street and then started taking them into the living room. I didn't check them. Like, these are the bottles we've sampled. They're in the living room now. Remember, all the way to the ceiling. Like you couldn't like walk in the house. Like this you couldn't wide. walk in the house. It's a container, Lord, yeah. yeah man, Even a was... pallet's a lot, but a container. A container. Like, I can't remember how many pallets it was. Thousands of them. And then, yeah, we. Got, I think these guys got home, checked the bottles. And First what, few were okay, and then, and then it went we down. We started opening them. And like the seam, like the seam of a bottle like that. I think someone cut themselves, didn't they? It was like sharp and jaggedy. Yeah. And then we're taking the lids off and the lid just came off. And we're like, oh, the lid doesn't screw on. Oh, maybe it's a dodgy bottle. 
we checked random boxes random same boxes thing. 10 in each one check them every single one they had glass inside yeah like glass sh- like shards of glass yeah, dust. the glass dust the lids didn't fit they were like cheap and tacky they were nine peas worth of bottle basically <laughs> every single one of them was crap we then i basically oh no then we actually we couldn't keep them in the living room because we couldn't live there like mm. there was no space took him to my grand's house which is about 10 minutes down the road and she said look you can put them in in my garage in her shed that they didn't i mean we'd put them as much as we could in there and like, what the hell do we do with these and we just had to scrap them we had to yeah, skip in it we had to buy a skip, skip. Them we had to skip them so spend more money on a skip outside the house so i phoned one of my mates who runs a skip hit. company I'm like mate do you take glass bottles he goes oh that's called hardcore you need a special skip cost this much we're like oh my <laughs> god he's another hit yeah man. then i had to take him again from that shed because everyone was at work again i was off from my grand's shed <laughs> into the skip by myself <laughs> luckily one of my mates bam love you he turned up and helped me bin all this stuff so we've got you doing workouts I didn't, no was one was killer. safe yeah. if you knew us friends family at that time no one was safe like what are you doing this weekend come around come around isn't it <laughs> make, put everyone some. to work <laughs> And then we'd, I mean, we'd feed and party with everyone afterwards, but everyone got put to work. Like, no Honestly, one was safe. People were picking chilies. There'd be people getting ready for shows. There'd be people binning stuff, cleaning it, like, always. Yeah. Like, like, so what kind of hit did you take on those glass bottles then? Is it? I mean, look, at the time, it was maybe £5,000, something okay. like that. And, and again, look, bear in mind, like, we were losing ourselves over £900. Like, to spend that and to lose that was huge at that time. I mean, thankfully, like, when we started to produce on scale, we found a co-packer. And he made the sauce about 90% accurate. You know, that was as close as we could get to uh, my dad's recipe. And so they, you know, they had the bottles. They gave us a fixed price for the finished product in a case of six. So that was, that was sweet for us. Um, I think it's an important lesson for our listeners that are going out to speak to suppliers and yeah. uh, trying to get glass bottles or yeah, products yeah, yeah, or yeah. manufacturing that these lessons do happen. We started selling Ooh, then we ordered similarly like a thousand bottles, so not as big. But yeah, some of them had little marks on and yeah. uh, some of them don't close properly or the gold on our bottles is all scratched. Right, so right, right. You can't use, so you might get a thousand pieces, but 200 of them are exactly. not worth it. So you're putting the bottom line on a thousand pieces being at a certain price, yeah. but when you lose two, three hundred, the price of the 700 then goes up. Changes so. completely, man. Do you remember the, um, that company in Birmingham? The source one. Yeah, oh, this is a... This is a a story and a half right so it's so frustrating to hear these stories it's good for the listeners so uh, this one's horrible this is a so when we um i can't remember i think it was 2010 sorry 2009 we got approached by the bbc to appear on a tv show called high street dreams it was going to be bbc one bbc two something like that bbc one prime time Prime time monday night 9 p.m Right, they they asked us to audition for it. I thought it was a prank, a scam, because we were getting scam emails all the time. But it was a real thing, real production team. They followed us around for three months and they filmed us. So when, when this was happening, sorry, we were still doing these food shows and farmers right, markets. Right, right. And when we were doing them, we were going to like any little town and doing these shows. And there was like a little lady making jam. There was a guy making biscuits or whatever. Then seven of us like, East London, East London Asians Jesus. turn up, just loud, <laughs> yeah. shouty, cockney, just, oh, come try my chilli sauce. My dad's got his Indian English accent, like my mum's. Hey, you guys, what are you doing? <laughs> like my, my, my wife, my, my brothers, my sister, everyone's shouting, come try the sauce, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're doing this, so people started knowing who we were, and that's when we got And the that. people are blogging about us, they're writing about us, talking about us on socials. Now, have you seen this like, weird family that mm. makes sauce and shout So that's people. how the BBC found us. They were just searching for like small companies, and they came across us. So we applied, we got selected, and they filmed us for three months. And like, this <coughs> crew, it's a crew, like a proper production crew of 20, 30 people coming to our house almost every day to film us. And we appeared on this TV show called High Street Dreams. It was seen by like millions of people. And essentially, it goes, you're, you're taking from your home to the high street. That's the big pitch of it. So we got the opportunity to pitch Asda. We pitched Asda. They said yes. They wanted to list our product. We thought we'd won the lottery. Yeah. We, you know, my man's shopping for Ferraris. Right? He's <laughs> like, yeah, he's like, on the Ferrari yeah, website. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm on it, mate. We've made it. We've made it. <laughs> and so uh, they said to us, "We'll help you. You know, we're going to help you grow." 
on it. So they don't, yeah, you might want to beat that out, but they didn't help in any way. Uh, they were nice enough about it, but they don't help you. And But what they did do, they connected us with um, a, a company uh, called CoFresh. And we went to meet them. They were lovely. Remember them? In uh, Birmingham? No, no, no. They were in Leicester. Leicester, the Leicester. The uh, Gujarati guys. Yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. They were lovely people. He goes, look, we don't make sauces, but we know these other people in Birmingham. So they connected us to these guys up in Birmingham. And they've got the same surname as my mum has. So we went all up there and... We made the mistake of, oh, you know, same family name, they'll look after us, this, that, the other. Yeah. Massive facility. Like, we've never seen anything like this, right? And we were hand-making it in the shed, and yeah. all of a sudden we're in this, like, professional, factory. massive factory. And we're trying to say to them, look, this is how we want the product. Jo Malone, who's on the TV show with us, she was, like, our mentor. She said, remember, you are their customer. You are paying them. It's their job to make your product how you want it. Don't accept anything less. So I'm not, I'm going to listen. you sold your company to S.A. Lauder for God knows how many millions. I'm going to listen to what you tell me. So I went in there and I said to them, this is how we want our product. And they kept making it, making it, making it. And they never quite got it right. And they wanted to put like xanthan gums in it and stabilizers and all these preservatives. I know, like people we like it because it's... six ingredients in our product. There's six Keep ingredients, like that. real ingredients. There's no crap in it. It's proper. Just use these things. Why did they do that then? Why did Make they put it all that? It's easier for them. Yeah, okay. it's easier for them to for their processes uh, to stabilize it and they cook it at a certain temperature. And we're like, look, that's great, but I don't care. Oh yeah, I but you can like sell it for fifty p then. I don't want to sell it for fifty p. It's not fifty p product. It's, it's a two a, pound product. It's a premium products, you know, with the premium quality. So anyway, like they eventually made something that <coughs> resembled our product. We're like, okay, fine. And I remember on the day of production. Uh, before production I said look before you produce the product when you're cooking it call us I'm going to send my dad down there to give you the final sign off they they hated the fact that we were insisting on this and they called us on the day and said look you have to get here we're doing the sauce and bear in mind we're in London it takes two and a half three hours to get to Birmingham so my parents had to leave poor parents at 6am rush up there to taste this product and they're like cooks it's not that good and I'm like and I'm, then I speak to the owner and he goes, no, no, it'll get better as it matures in the bottle. I'm like, okay, fine. And so they made this product and uh, we get the delivery and my dad calls me, he goes, Cooks, this isn't right. And I, what do you, I start blaming my dad. What do you mean? You don't know what you're talking about. It's fine. It's going to be okay. He goes, look at it, look at it. So he brings some bottles home of sauce. Do you remember this? It looked like red Ribena. Yeah, <laughs> like water. it looked like vinegar ribena with stuff at the bottom. Like yeah. bitty. I'm yeah. losing my shit now, right? I'm like, what on earth? This we've just spent fifteen thousand pounds on this. It's the first time we've ever invested this type of money on such a large scale production. So that's the first batch. First time we've ever done Outsourced this. Outsourced it. We and were and this is supposed it. to go to ASDA, right? This is supposed to go to ASDA, and I'm losing it. And I'm calling this guy up. I'm going, you know, what have you guys done? This is what you've made. And he goes, no, no, you must be wrong. I said, I'm coming to see you tomorrow and I'm going to show you. Went up there, showed him the product and I showed him our original product. Like, you tell me now. You, I mean, you can't. When it's in front of you like that, you can't deny it. And this guy owns the business and he's like, look, I don't know what's happened. This, that. And then he tried to blame us about how we were insisting on this process and this, that, the other. I said, look, I'm not paying for this. We'll make this batch ourselves and we'll supply it as the. And he was like, oh, okay, fine. And it got a bit sour. And I remember like a few months later, my man sent me an invoice for £15,000, <laughs> right? He, he gave us a bit of a refund on that money. Then he tries to send me another invoice. Oh no, because they remade it. They remade the sauce and it still wasn't good enough. Right. Then he tried to invoice me for that. So I was like, you tell your lawyers, if you're going to take, take it to law, you tell them to come and speak to me. You do this today. I want to hear from your lawyers today. Obviously, he didn't do anything with it. Yeah. He knew he knew what he was doing. No, man. He, knew. he was just trying to scam it. So he was trying to like because we're we're small, like we in comparison. But you know, this is the thing that like, you learn from. We were trying to outsource the production of our products because we didn't want to be a manufacturing company. We wanted to be a brand. We wanted to build a brand, and so that's that's the kind of journey that we went on. And eventually, we found someone really, really good that cared as much as we did about the product. But this is part of the journey of making the sauces and why also we decided to move away from it's the not, world of sauces. It's not easy finding right, the right suppliers and manufacturers. No. It's, 
right? Yeah, they all they'll sell you the dream. They'll tell yeah. you whatever you want to hear at yeah, the beginning. Yeah. We had a really good one in in Newbury. The first ones, they they didn't make massive amounts. What was it? Newbury in Reading, up in Reading somewhere. What was that guy? Oh, uh, pots, pots, something like that. Yeah, they were they were nice people. Mm. And then you just get someone like that. Yeah, and then he, even when like he was talking about that BBC f- TV show that went out. Like the amount of publicity again we got off of that. Oh, the website crashed, remember? The, yeah. So the yeah, the TV show went out on a Monday, like prime time. I think they had like six million viewers or something like that. And our website was just something we had made. It's gone on the BBC now. Within minutes, the website's crashed. It's too much people. Like thousands of orders. And like, oh yeah, then <laughs> the day after the show went out, everyone went to work. I was home alone and we've got, thousands of orders to send out there's we're lucky we had products but we had no packaging because we were all selling some here and there yeah, online we had to take a week off remember i had to go to like the back of like mina stores which is like a like an indian grocery shop like, you got any boxes because mm-hmm. yeah take them so i took loads of cardboard boxes cutting them with scissors wrapping bottles by hand like 600 of them till these guys got home from work posting and when we went to the post office on top of the road bags and bags and this postman was like what the what is this I was like, oh we was on tv yesterday oh, <laughs> can you post this for us Definitely. please <laughs> it was mad so you said something just a little bit earlier about in getting investors on board did you get investors on board for the bottle business or the the crisp business or was it all one so it was it was for the bottle business originally um the tv show everything had happened well, i was still self-funding the whole thing and then when we were selling we were using whatever profits we were making back into the business um but you know it got to a point where like my wife kind of turned to me and goes look you better start making some money from this now uh, otherwise it's taken up all of our lives yeah what are you going to do about it and i remember i went to my best mate uh shout out zorba i love you brother um and he's an accountant right and he's you know this is my boy i've known him since i was 11 and I said, to, and I sat there and I was kind of having a moan. I was like, oh man, look, what do we do? Like, it's taking so much money. How do we make it work? And he turned to me and he goes, you know, I don't think you've tried hard enough. And I lost it with him. I go, what do you mean? <laughs> you know how hard we've been working. This, like the other. He goes, no, no, no. What I mean is about money for the business. Have you tried going out, speaking to banks, investors, doing this type of thing? And I was like, well, Actually, no, I haven't. I haven't looked down that channel before. And luckily, I had experience with raising money for my pe- previous business and speaking to investors. So I started down that process of like trying to raise money for investors. How much money do I need? What what goes into a deck? You know, what information do people want? Um, and I remember I gave myself a deadline. I said, look, if I don't do this by the end of uh, December 2012, if I don't get this money, I'm shutting the company down because it's just consuming too much time, energy, money of everyone's lives. It's not going to work. And I remember I wanted a uh, hundred hundred and twenty k or something like that. Um, and so I came across this platform called the Angel Investor Network, and I uploaded my 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 deck, and they they had a special program. It was like a hundred pounds, and then that hundred pounds could go out to like way more investors and oh man this is 100 pounds mm-hmm. again like limiting Scarcely beliefs mindset, yeah yeah, uh, yeah the mindset was wrong but i spent the money and it went out to everyone and literally the next day i got an email back from them saying look we've got a live event that's coming up in uh, november and we'd like for you to apply i was like okay sure um there's a there was 600 applicants and i got an email about a week later saying you've been shortlisted for the last 60 we're going to do a phone interview did a phone interview a week later after that they're like you've been selected there's gonna be, there's going to be uh, six other businesses there's a room full of 60 investors and you're gonna have seven minutes to pitch okay fine so none of my family knew this was happening like i i kind of carried it all in my own mind and in my own head didn't even tell my wife and i remember on the day of the event i said to my wife i was like <coughs> b i need your help uh, i've got this event in the evening can you come and sample uh the product and she's like, what's this for? And I said, well, this is what I've been planning to do. And I've been working on it evenings and weekends for like months and months. She's like, what? You know, why didn't you tell me? And, 
you know, we're supposed to be doing this together and all this other stuff. So anyway, I went there and did my pitch. And I, I remember saying at the end of my pitch, if I don't get the investment today, I'm closing the company down. And in the pitch, I was, I talked about the fact that we've been on TV, the, you know, we've been written about in the press, you know, all these incredible things are happening. Tom Parker Bowles, like the, is, it, is she the queen? queen Camilla? Queen consort now. Camilla, you yeah, know, Charles's yeah. wife, his, her son, he came to our house because he's a journalist, right? He wrote about our product and he loves chili products. So he loves our products and you know, he's a really cool guy. So all this stuff went into my deck and I just said, look, if I don't get what I want today, I'm walking away. And that event finished at eight. I remember I didn't leave that room until like one thirty in the morning because I had 10 people around me asking me questions about the business. And that event, I secured uh, two investors for for the business. I got three, sorry, I got three investors for my business. One of them pulled out, but by March 2013, we got the money that I wanted. And so that's how we kind of all went full time because that investment money, I employed like Rav and my dad and my younger brother, Butch as well, isn't it? Mm. So there's four of us employed by the company, full time, being paid wages. And that's how we really kind of kicked off after that to get into the supermarkets and to try and turn it into a proper business. That's interesting. For the listeners that are listening right now that are at the stage where they potentially want to get investors, they don't know how you go and get investors. Yeah. What kind of advice could you give them uh, from your experience? In my experience, I would say most people don't need money. Most people do not need money. There's a problem in their business that they haven't solved as of yet and they think money is going to solve the problem. And by selling a stake in your company, it's actually going to make that problem bigger. So the start point should be what what is your goal for your business where do you really want to take things and have you done the groundwork to turn your business into an actual business now a business by definition is a commercial and profitable enterprise that works without you so if you were to walk away from your business today for six months could you still come back and your business is operating without you if the answer to that is no then there's work to be done to build your business let's say you're a one-man band and you, you talked about Oud earlier, right? So you need yeah. cash up front. You need to do certain, certain things. Even with that type of business, you know, if that's all someone's doing and it's a side hustle and they're selling on Shopify, there's probably a lot of work that they need to be doing on their marketing, on their uh, ordering systems, on their logistics, on their recruitment even. You know, they could hire part-time PAs or VAs. They could have a an external team of freelancers then and the systems and processes in place that are ensuring that content's coming in and email marketing's going out and everything's in place yeah. that you're maximizing what you can do by yourself because the idea is that you as the founder of that business have to be replacing yourself as often as you possibly can with every single role in that particular business and we didn't obviously know that at that time i just thought money would solve the problem um and so once if someone has done that then if they're looking to go out and get money, um, I would then say the next part of it is know what type of in investor you want coming into your business. It's a relationship. Do you want someone that's hands off? Do you want someone that's going to be a mentor? And if they are a mentor, you're going to have to date them. Like you have to know what this person's like because they now own part of your business, which is essentially your life, your baby that you're building. So it's got to be the right type of person first, attitude first, money second. If those two things have been ticked, so you've built the business as much as you can, you've found the right criteria of attitude that you want, that's when you start going out looking for people. Now, where do you find people? There's hundreds of different ways. Friends and family networks. You know, Speak to the richest person you know and say, look, can you recommend me someone I can speak to who can advise me on where I can meet investors? You're never going to go direct to someone. It's like a first date. You're not going to go on a first date and ask to kiss the girl on the first date, right? That's you know it doesn't work like that you have to put the work into it and really learn about your marketplace and learn about the investors that are out there because chances are the wealthiest person you know probably knows other people that are relatively wealthy or successful and that's where it will start then you know there's networking groups there's investor groups there's startup incubators there's so many different places you can turn to online to start finding investors and and believe me you know like recently the recession has been announced in in our country but there's so much money out there. So, so many people sitting on cash, 10K, 20K, 100K, 200K cash. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, it's right, man. There's people I've met with just 
just so much money. Like, why? How have you got that? It just sits and in their bank account. Yeah, they don't know what yeah. to do with it. They're you, desperate for opportunities. I think when you've got the scarcity mindset and you've never been around it, you you can't understand it yes, until you yeah. actually see yeah, it yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And and so you know that, like we talked about a lot, I think that held us back a lot. And it was only until you start unlocking new knowledge, meeting new people with different mindsets to you, mm. and changing your environment, that you can then start being open to this type of world existing. And so if you're going like. I would say learning from my own experience at that time going out raising money i was going out raising money luckily successfully whatever i got the money but i was still in a scarcity mindset so when i first had 145 thousand pounds in my bank account from these investors and i showed my family i felt like i owed them my life these people have backed me they've trusted me with their money i owe them everything i can't make a mistake but it doesn't work like that they've chosen to take a chance and invest on you they know that money could be lost they know that this could happen, that that could happen. Of course, no one wants that, but they know, they're you know they they're in it for the they're in it for the profits. It's risk versus reward, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're doing it for a reason. They know the the downside to it, um, and you have to be confident in yourself and know that there's enough abundance out there for you to get what you want. Whereas if you go into it where you've got a scarcity mindset, like we, like I had definitely. You just operate in a completely different way that holds you back. And so all these things come into it. I wouldn't say there's, un- unfortunately, there's no one straight piece of advice I can give someone to go out there and raise money. I think the clearer, the cleaner your own vision is, the cleaner your own plan is, the better it will serve you. You know, like, th- that's, that's probably the cleanest re- answer I can give to that question. Yeah, that's really informative. And out of all the platforms... Would you say the crowdfunding, because you mentioned something earlier about crowdfunding yeah. versus getting one or two investors, what would you say the difference is? So I would say you, you definitely need what is it's called anchor investors. So these people are your um, kind of foundation investors. Even with crowdfunding, unless you've got a compelling story that it makes, it's a no-brainer and there's, it, there's some risk, but it's seemingly no risk to invest in your business. You don't necessarily need like anchor investors, um, but most of the time you will. So anchor investors are also known as like angel investors. It could be friends and family coming in with a couple of thousand, five, ten, twenty, hundred thousand, whatever the the amount is. But these people are like your foundational investors because what happens is you can then go to these platforms, and it sh- it gives them confidence that someone else has come in, an individual has come in and put money in. Like oh, okay, someone else has done that. I'm willing to go out to my network of 50, 60,000 investors and say, look, invest in this company now. So that's that's how crowdfunding works um, the best. Okay. So going back to Mr. Sings and the crisps and new business, how is that going now for you? Uh, what kind of stage are you at? Uh, what's going on? Uh, Maybe start in the summer. Like how? So for the last five years, I've had a full-time job. I was doing well. I enjoyed it. It was... So I got two two sons, my wife, and I, it was just time, man. I weren't seeing my kids. I weren't seeing my wife. I was seeing them at like half seven, eight o'clock at night. Weekend dad. Weekends, but at weekends we were flying. Like we were, we went away like seven, eight times last nice. year. Every weekend we were somewhere, I, which also, was great. Sorry to jump in. Like he's underselling it. Like he was smashing it. Like he was doing yeah. so well. Like, what, right. uh, in a sit as an estate. Yeah, I mean it was yeah it was great. Like I've never had money like that in my life. Never had stability in my life like that. Like it was all Christy. It was just time. And I always thought if I've loads of money, I'm gonna be super happy. Then I had m- more money than I I've ever had in my life. But not and I was time. like, this is shit. Like I can't. What's the point? Like I weren't enjoying it anyway. Towards the end. Um, and every time he tried to leave, they just kept giving him more money. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got promoted after the first time. I Three times, right? You tried Something to Something like that. But yeah, I was I was enjoying it. Like it was just that. It was like, what do I do now? Do I keep earning money and not seeing my family or do I see my this family? Is life now, isn't it? Yeah, what do I do now? And I was right. like, it's sick having this money. You're so, you feel so secure. But then I can't, I, I, six months ago was the first time I dropped and picked my kids up from school. They're nine and six years old now. I'd never done it before. No, the that's te- just because you're working so much hours. Yeah. The, my son, when I got to school, he's like, that's my dad. The teacher goes, which one's your dad? <laughs> and I'm there like that. She had no idea who I was. <laughs> She yeah. had literally no idea who I was. Well, that's Both deep. boys. And um, 
that that was mine, man. I wanted to leave. I got offered loads of different jobs. I was head headhunted daily, and I was like, "This company is the best company that I want to work for. I don't want to leave to go to another company. What's the point?" Then me and Cooks were in the summer. We were just chilling, chilling at my mum and dad's house. I'm just talking. He goes, "I'm going to shut Mr. Sings down." I was like, "Oh shit! How come?" So I just, I just don't want to do it. He goes, "I'll oh, come check some numbers." So me, my younger brother, and him was in his room. He showed me some numbers, and I was like. The numbers look sick. They'll work. Why don't you do it? Because I've just fallen out of love with you. I don't want to do it anymore. I was like, damn. Like, it's, it's happening since I was 22 years old, Mr. Yeah. Sings. Yeah. It's a long time. I was like, but the numbers, like, they're real numbers. And then I said to him, I want to leave. And the only thing I will leave for is to do Mr. Sings again. That's the only thing I'd leave this job for. And he's like, have you, can you invest in it? I said, yeah, I've got money spare. Like, let's do it. And he goes, I'll match whatever you put in. I said, oh, sick, let's do this. This was in June. Uh, July, we I worked. August, I had a two-week holiday. I was in Turkey. I got back from Turkey and gave my notice in at work and quit my job in September, middle of September. Right. Did my notice and then I quit. Got you had like a month off, two months off? No, I took three months off. Like, I didn't do anything. It's a nice just little play. break. It was fantastic. Spend time with the kids. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah, just, I'm just in my shorts. <laughs> just in my shorts. The middle of the day, Tuesday, doing nothing. Yeah, that's It was nice. great, man. And then got the office sorted. Um, Mr. We, Sings. The, yeah, Mr. Singh's office. Um, really sick location. Like, the cool vibe. Like, young entrepreneurs, startups. Really nice bar. Yeah, I've seen a few snaps. Yeah, yeah, Your yeah. little logo on the wall. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's it right, lights yeah. up and it's sort that wire out. It's really annoying. Yeah. Um, yeah, setting all that up and we had this vision, we had a plan and I remember we ordered desks. So I got the desk delivered. I was in there. He was doing something. So I was fixing the desks, put that out and then we we were going to employ someone. So I ordered another desk and... No, we'd already I, employed though. We didn't, we didn't oh, I had, to see, I had to get a chair because I, oh, I had a chair missing. So I ordered the chair and the card didn't work, the bank card. And I was like, oh, maybe the website's down. So I tried it again on a different card. Is this um, the business bank account? The business yeah. account. So I tried to order it again. Didn't work. So I tried it on my laptop thinking, no, it's m my phone. Didn't work. And I said, oh, that's weird. Let me try it on my personal credit card. So I, And I just bought it. So that's weird. So I phoned him. I said, oh, something's wrong with the business account. It's not working. What do you mean? I said, yeah, I ordered the desks and stuff. It was fine. Just tried to order a chair. It's not coming. Not, something's happened anyway. He's looked into it and HSBC basically froze our accounts. Seriously. Like yeah. literally out of nowhere. So I could go into the app. I could see our money there. Because what happened um, in our business, because we've got, you know, it's, it's set up legally and professionally in terms of shareholders agreements, yeah. uh, you know, uh, articles of association. So anything that happens from an investment point of view, there's a process that takes place and you have to inform the investors that look, we're, we're taking in new money, it's a, a, a certain share price. And in our business, we've got four quite big investors and then we've got the crowdfunding investors represented by Cedars. So there's 450 individuals represented by Cedars. So you can call it five investors collectively. Yeah. Now, um, when Rav and I decided to put some money in, I have to tell them by law, this is the situation. And they've got something called preemption rights, which means that by right, as an existing shareholder, you can invest at the same price that we're investing in. Yeah, that makes you sense. don't have to take that preemption up, but you've got the rights to do that. And we were really surprised. Like The four main investors, uh, out, out of the four of them, two of them said, OK, we're putting money in. So we ended up putting like we had way more money than we originally anticipated mm. so the two investors wanted to put the same amount that you two were putting in uh mm. they actually put in a little bit more oh, okay. right they put in more um because we so the company was valued i think at 1.6 million pounds mm. and in order for him to get more of a shareholding i said look what i'm going to do is reduce the value of the company right because if it's valued at let's say 1.5 million pounds and he puts in a hundred thousand he didn't put in a hundred but i'm just saying if he puts in a hundred thousand yeah. right he's going to get whatever it is as a percentage. Um, but if the company is valued at, let's say, 500,000 and he puts in 100,000, he, gets, he gets way more. He's going to get 20%, right? right? Um, 
And so that's what we decided to do. So d decided to reduce the valuation of the company from 1.5, 1.6 million, whatever it was. We reduced it down. So they were all like, well, the value of the company has gone down. I can get more, I can own more of this company with a larger investment. Yeah. So that's why they wanted to put in more money. So we're like, okay, this is incredible, right? It changes everything in terms of how we want to move forward. And we're now building a business in the right way. And the account's frozen, so I can look at this money, I can't touch it. Yeah. And bear in mind, our employees handed in her notice. She's got an eight-week notice period because she's a really important employee for the company that she was leaving. She's a critical employee for us, critical hire. And we're like... She tells know. terrible jokes, though. You know, wages are going to start, <laughs> you know, uh, shout out, Cardio. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, wages were going to start in January, and we're like, the office rent is starting to go out. We wanted to make our produce production produce our product because we've got thousands of customers that want the product and we can't touch our money like what do we do got the guy of one of a, a national chain texting me weekly can i get them and i'm just saying no to this guy ouch yeah, we've got cust situation. old customers texting us messaging us buy your product oh you're, you're back your website's not working oh yeah we can't actually produce now and we've got so yeah go on. this continued now for three months, I'm speaking to HSBC all the time. Uh, they're not responding. You get through to business banking and then it stops. It doesn't go any higher. It's a special team somewhere that's frozen your account. We can't tell you. We don't know what's going on. So, we're like, oh, man. And then anyway, three months later, we get a letter through the post and it says, we've shut your bank account down. That's it. No reason given, no explanation, Nothing. no questions. And uh, during COVID, I'd taken a, the bounce back loan. And there was uh, the bounce back loan was sitting there and we were paying it off monthly because that's how you pay off a loan, right? Yeah. So that it aids your cash flow and helps you grow the business. And they basically took the cash that was in our bank account and wiped out the loan. So we don't have any loan now, which is great, but they've taken all of our cash that we had in this particular bank account from my investors Straight to pay off the loan. The loan yeah. And wow. they sent us a check for 2,900 pounds. And we're like, what have you done with our money? You're going to kill us. I mean, thankfully, we still, you know, we didn't put all of the money into that bank account uh, because we told the, the other investors that this was going on. So they all kind of held back until this was solved. But the point being is that, that that was a big, big lump sum of money that we were going to use to launch our business. Uh, and so now the, the work that I've got in particular is I have to speak to my investors and say, look, can you put in more money? <laughs> Replace uh, the money that HSBC took. How's and, that and conversation you can, going? It's difficult. <laughs> I had a very difficult conversation this morning with someone who's a lovely guy and he's supporting us. But he's like, look, this is a tough spot. You've got you to gotta work for it now. So that's part of where we are now. I mean, the other part of it is that it's a blessing in disguise because had we just pressed go on production... We were sat in the office talking about this and it was like, it's, it's the most frustrating thing, right? Because we wanted to do this offices there cars quit, there, job, quit my job i refinance property properties being refinanced we went all in on this and like this is the plan end of january we're going to launch and we're sitting in the office damn he was getting quite down about it you i know, really was like, he was focused on product i need the product that's the only way it can work that's the only way we can sell um and, and I, I think you know you can add to this but i think the blessing in disguise mm. was that it's allowed us to Imagine a dark room, turn on a torch and look at every single corner of the room and identify where the gaps in the holes are. Any systems and processes that we're missing, there, there's gaps in our marketing, there's gaps in our uh, strategy, there's gaps in uh, the operations. There's so many gaps that we've identified. And then it's also forced us, if you look at things in the right way, there's always an opportunity. And so this, op this forced break from producing the product has forced us to get creative in terms of how we talk about our story and talk about our brand because we always kind of banked on the old story of how we started the company but then we when we sat down and we said look the thing that's always carried us through and has resonated with people is being truthful just be honest and truthful about who we are and what we're doing today and that's what we did mm. we put it out there we're like look guys it's Rav and me in the business now pops is still there but we're running the business and we're pushing the business forward and we're growing it. This is what's happened. This is how things are working out. And that's what people connected to. And so it's taught us that, okay, 
let's tell the truth always let's tell our truth let's be authentic and our entire marketing strategy now is based on that and that would only come from the fact that we were forced to have that conversation because hsbc has frozen our money and the way in which we've designed the business now is it's untouchable and unrecognizable from what it was three months ago yeah um that's that is what it did man it forced us to get creative and be like all right cool we ain't got product we ain't got how can you sell the product without having the product yeah how can we just tell our story without having it? i mean we still get messages are oh, your website still down it's like yeah i know so you've we'll taken we'll a lot of time to focus on marketing i know you guys were saying off camera you've got a podcast yeah yeah, yeah. releasing we started filming those a couple of weeks ago what's the aim behind that then are you doing something similar to speaking to business owners customers what was so the kind of podcast uh, we want to do about families right family well, businesses sorry, let me, before you continue i just want to add one a step further back one of the questions we asked ourselves is why do people connect to mr singh right yes our products but it's it's family stories the fact that we have fun and that we're authentic and we're, we're a food business and food our purpose like i talked about earlier our business saved our family and our purpose has always been bringing people together bring people together with food bring people together with our stories and so we talked about this and we're like okay how can we do this with a podcast how can we be truthful talk about family how can we bring people together different cultures different stories and tell those stories moving forward because that still aligns with who we are and what we stand for might not be talking about chili chris but it aligns with who we are yeah. that's that's yeah, so that's that's basically what we did we was like, all right cool that's we've got a family business our story is interesting we did start from a garden shed and it's brought us today here to a podcast with you which would never have happened if that didn't happen yeah so we've found family businesses in food um in and, london in london and we've got some out of london yeah though. true true and just for them to tell their story, why did they start a family business? And, it's and it always so starts with that question, why? Why? Why, why did, did you start or why did you join or why did you, did you decide to expand your family business? Because most people, why would they want to work with their family? Yeah. It's a mean? mad thing to do, like work with your family. You see them before work, after work, weekends. That's, that's who we are with. So that probably leads me nicely to the question, how do you guys work together as a family and as brothers Oh, you answer this one first. How do we work together? Yeah. I thought yeah. we were all right. We, we butt heads like a lot. We did this. He got me to do. No, we all did it actually. A, a personality test. And we found out like mine and his are so similar. But we do things completely different. Yeah. I'm so like A to B unfocused. Like driving up, driving anywhere with him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if it's six hours. I will go from my house to there. To here today was four hours. From London, yeah. Up north I will drive me. straight here. <coughs> This guy wants to stop for coffee, I need to toilet. <laughs> no, just get there. That, so mine's very like that. We will always end up at that same place. We get there in different ways. But I think we work well together compared to how we used to. Mm. I think we've both matured a lot. Mm. Like we still get annoyed at each other. We're brothers, we're gone new. Um, but I think, I think we get on all right. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, like, I, I think the good... How, how do I say this? I, I feel like... It. Say how you want to say it. Our, Ooh, our, our, thing yeah, same, is, and our thing is always like, just have fun, right? Just have fun with what you're doing. Like we've been through a lot of like experiences in our life, like near-death experiences and stuff like that. And so we so like uh, value near life. Near-death experience. Gives a near yeah, death yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, mate. I think we're going to make everyone cry. How uh, many? So yeah, the first one was, the, ma the major one for us was when India. we were... India. In India, right, we were, I was, I think, 12. He must have been eight. Butch must have been four. three. Maybe so we, four, yeah. we were in India um, and we were in, probably similar in Pakistan, right? They got these tiny little cars, Maruti vans. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they fit about 90 people in these <laughs> vans, right? Just, just <laughs> cram them in as much as they can. Yeah. So we're, it's, it's us five, my, my, my nun so in the front was the driver. My, sorry, in the front was my mum, my dad, the driver. Then this side was Grandma. my gran with my younger brother on her lap because he was little. Me and then... No, I was in the middle. You were on the right-hand side. Oh, yeah. So anyway, we're in this yeah. van, pitch black in uh, Ludhiana, right? In mm. Ludhiana, right? Pitch black, coming back from somewhere. Like my parents, when they go to India, they just go to a village life. Like we hate it. 
Yeah. I want to see yeah. the rest of the country, but no, you just go sit in a village with a cow. Is so that because they're from the village? Yeah. So yeah. Like, I don't know where we were going or what we were doing, but anyway, I just remember it pitch black. We're in this like Muruti, and like. I just remember seeing these. Do you remember the headlights? Mm. It's like just I just see headlights. I can hear those horns in my and head I'm like, now. What is that? And matey at the front, right? He's just blah, 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 like doing what he's doing, driving. Yeah. I'm like, but when this guy's van, when he pressed the brakes, it it veered right. Okay. So every time you brake, the car would do this. The whole day it was doing that, right? So yeah. this we're driving, and you know those massive lorries in India. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, like look at the bells and the graffiti on it like 900 yeah. people in the back yeah so this guy coming this way there was something in the road he swerved it coming head on towards us as this we didn't break we've just crushed into this thing no. yeah so like basically crushed my parents they but all these people basically ripped the no, no no before that like before they came out like we like woke up like oh, in the actual car. In the car. Like, I'm looking over at him. Oh, thank God he's all right. My my grandma's sh shoulders popped out. My little brother's busted. crying. My mum, like, uh, my mum and dad like that in the front. I'm like... Bleeding. What has happened? My younger then, brother, sorry, when the car hit, as he hit forward on the back of that seat, his head went back and broke my grand's nose. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My mum and dad were unconscious in the front of the car, just covered in blood. The driver got out walked out and we were all a mess and then that's the when the people came out and they tore this van apart with their hands man like and they we were just lucky that like this roof. van's full of people this lorry and they pulled us out of this car they put us in separate vehicles i remember pops well, we were kids though as well remember my dad that, gave yeah. me this bag he goes don't let anyone touch this briefcase right some for somehow he had the consciousness to tell me that <clears throat> i'm not like, okay and then we basically found out it's got all of our money in it. And like you open it, like we felt like mm. like uh, Arab uh, oil dealers, yeah. man. Like once we opened it, and we saw the money inside. But I remember we got to the. No, I remember when they pulled my mum out. Like you may not want to hear this part, but they pulled my mum out on the street, and uh, her her leg had broken, her bone was sticking out of the shin, oh, sure. and her, her hip had shattered. My dad had broken his arm here, so it was like flopping, and he'd broken, I think, his thigh um grandma was her he he'd got um sprains somehow i was okay so anyway we got to the hospital they were gonna like cut my mum's leg off and because they couldn't save it and all this other stuff long story short we got flown back to the uk thank god like my parents were okay we were okay but you know, for months after that, my grandma tried to raise us, and I think that's when we went a bit wild. My parents were both in hospital. Yeah. It was just us three at home. My and grand so, trying to yeah. Look growing, yeah, like, and then remember the area that we're growing up in, and now we there's no parents. We're we're getting lawless. Yeah, you can enjoy uh, that. And so going back to what we were saying, like we're very grateful for life. You know, mm. that we know it can go like that, and it's given like that. And so going back to working together, it's always like, just uh, let's just have fun with this. Do you know what I mean? Like, don't take it so seriously. Just have fun with it. And I think because we've got that same mindset, it always lands in the same place. And I think like you were talking about beforehand, you know, for some, you know, I've ended up as the, the kind of like the head, head of the business, head of the family in that way. And I'm trying to get everyone to do things, but I don't even know what I'm doing myself. And so I think this kind of Mr. Sings 2.0 is the more i wouldn't say more mature but the more like learned versions of each of us mm. we've been through each of our own journeys to grow and mature as as men as people as humans and so like we're just working in completely different ways and i think the biggest thing that i've learned over the over time is the the most powerful skill in communication with other humans is actually being able to listen because like, most of us when we talk if you observe a conversation what happens is most of the time like you're a really good listener i could tell yeah. you're listening right most of the time what happens in conversation people wait for a gap and then they give their opinion yeah but ah but this but da, 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 they just wait for a gap they give their opinion if someone's truly listening like i could tell you are you f it makes me feel like i'm important it makes me feel like i'm truly being listened to and so likewise with us we've had to learn how to communicate with one another and then when you've got slightly similar styles that can be quite challenging, but we know that we we both want to end up in the same place, and we can be honest with each other. Hmm. If I, if I be like, look, so I remember um, 
when we in the first week or something something happened he goes cook you were a dick right you, you did that thing and you were a dick to me if we had done that 10 years ago it would be a big thing it would be a fight yeah. and an argument and then oh, got to see, see him again oh. fine we'll yeah. just do it because we have to and then like it'd melt away but yeah, eventually it'll go, but it still it's happened. Like it's just. Yeah. But versus, versus now, it's like you know what? Yeah, I was all right. I'll change. I'll do my best to change. That that's the big thing. I like, just. Like yeah, I think a great example is, um, you know, we we're doing some uh, like an email campaign, and he sent me a draft, and uh, I I read it, and I know my man's just gone on to Chat GPT, right? <laughs> Write it into a Word document and sent it to me. And I was like, listen, I can tell this is from Chat GPT. It's got this, 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 and this in it. Like you can't be lazy like that. You have to step up now. I'm expecting you to be the. O I want you to be the owner of marketing. I want to be chasing you. Yeah, he's leveraging AI technology. He's yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah. Old, isn't he? Doesn't know it works. <laughs> yeah, no, I so, can see the benefits. But it's that of type of conversation that I think you have to have yeah. if you're going to be in business with someone, whether it's your brother, your best mate, uh, what, whoever it is, you have to be able to have that level of conversation and. Um, not worry about not worry about fight. it it's yeah. you know there's a book called candid candid something but basically it means that whatever you are saying to the person you're saying in the most constructive way possible and it's coming from a place of kindness and the other person knows it I think that's that's what it was before like he'd i probably said stuff to him but he'd say stuff and like, oh, i've just been a dick about it but he's probably he's not he's actually telling you something i just didn't know how to communicate in in the right way yeah and not like try and beat around the bush but do it in a way where you're not saying you know what you're crap at doing that and you need to do this but okay look this was this was this was a good good start but we, and we need to go here now how are you going to do that and ask questions ab about how that person can level up the things that they're doing so in terms of the crisps industry just a question that when you look at the market and it there's some big players in the market that look like they dominate how have you uh, been able to sort of stand out from the crowd and how do you look at competition for, uh, for just the, the crisp right even with the sources i know how good our products are i don't i don't need anyone to tell me that but i know that they're the they're the nuts when we launched the chili sauce a week later one of the biggest sauce companies not heinz like chili sauce companies in the country made a Punjabi version of their sauce and I was like that is so sick like they've noticed us when we launched the chili crisps and made noise with those every crisp company now does chili crisps and I was like that's because of us like we did that like to me not I was we're their competition man like I'm my own competition but he's Michael he's, Phelps right? Michael Phelps like he's got a good story about that yeah tell um, us the story I will. I, I mean, just to add to what he said, look, the crisps business in the UK, I think it's worth a billion pounds, yeah. right? It's a huge market. And, um, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of five-star reviews of people telling us why they love our product, mm. right? And it's because of the fact that it tastes like what it says on the packet, strong flavors, very strong flavors. The quality is high and the crunch it's a weird thing but they're really crunchy crisps and people love that uh, the story of each flavor as well like they're real like that is the recipe my dad used to have yeah and we made them vegan because i turned vegan a couple of years ago and i missed cheese yeah. and onion crisps so i wanted mm. cheese and onion crisps that made my breath smell like that's how like cheesy i wanted them they're like crisp. hummy but then like we remembered like growing up I don't know if you guys have this, but there's a like a they call it a Punjabi salad. It's not. It's onions, cheese, and then they put chili on top. I've seen that, yeah. Yeah. So um, we put that on crisps. Like we grew up with that's cheese and onion with chili. And when my dad used to have that restaurant we were talking about earlier, he used to make like these tandoori chicken oh, wings yeah. on a sizzler Hanging. sizzler plate. Unreal. So And yeah. I missed them. I couldn't have them. So I was like, Pops, put make make it taste like tandoori chicken. Like proper tandoori yeah. chicken. Like the flavours like so and my mouth's real. watering. And they're chili crisps. Watering. There's big signs on there that says chili crisps. They're actually chili crisps. We actually make one with the hottest chili in the world called the Carolina Reaper. Well, it used to be. There's one called Pepper X now, but not that one. We he sent we sent a tweet out saying, well, should we make the hottest crisp in the world? Or someone messaged us saying, can you make one with the hottest chili in the world? Um, he cooks wrote on there, 
if you get 500 retweets, we'll make it. And he got like a thousand retweets. I'm like, oh crap, got to make this now, yeah. Um, said to my dad, here's some Carolina Reaper. You need to make some hot crisps with this. He doesn't wear his glasses anyway. And he had the recipe. And basically, completely by accident, he put 25 times more powder than he <laughs> needed to. And he's come in because I've run out of powder. We went, How can you run out of powder with We've that much thousands crisps? Thousands of orders. People have paid for it already. Yeah. Like, you can't run out because the maths, you can't use that much powder on this many crisps. So I don't know, something's gone wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like, something wrong. What? Anyway, we found out he's put 25 times more powder than he needed to. So we messaged everyone saying, look, sorry, the order's going to be late. This is basically what's happened. Everyone just said, oh, I don't care. Send it to us. We're like, no, it's too hot. Like we tried it. I, I've had it once. I'm never eating it again. Is it, really it, just it cried, man. blew my head off. People are eating this stuff, sending us videos, yeah. And they are suffering. That's they're, good for marketing, though. It was brilliant it, for they, marketing. They taste nice. But yeah. they're so, they're so hot. hot. Yeah. Well, people like the reaction videos and all the rest oh, of Oh, we've yeah. got a few. We've got so, hence, uh, why that we, we can't compete against them. They're multi-billion pound businesses. We just, we just can't. Right. We can only focus on us. And going back to that Michael Phelps story um, is Ma Michael Phelps, you know, eight time or 10 time gold medal winning Olympic swimmer, right? The most decorated Olympic swimmer of all time. And there's a race, I think, at the Beijing Olympics, I think it is, um, against, it's him, against his main rival, a guy called Chad Leclos. And this guy is the only guy that's managed to beat him in a couple of the races. And Phelps needs to win this race to get his like, eighth medal uh, to, to be the record holder. And so then neck and neck this whole race, and there's a very famous picture, if you Google it, uh, uh, and Phelps is focused like on his lane and Chad Leclos is looking at Phelps. Now, there's no real way to really prove this, but the theory is that because Leclos looked over, he took his eye off the ball and Phelps won this race by literally like a finger's length. Like it was so close, but it's, it's said that this guy lost because he was looking at Phelps. Worried about his competition. He was right? worried about his competition. And, you know, I, I took that and I was like, this is like a code for life, Michael Phelps. I, and anytime anything happens and we are veering off tracks, we say Michael Phelps. And we like focus on our lane, focus on our lane. Like in one of my other businesses, like during COVID, my, like my ex-business partner screwed me over and like he got into property and I was like, I was watching this guy. And I was like, man, this guy's killing it. Like how, how, what's happening? And I just took my eye off the ball. And so honestly, for about two years, I used to write in my journal, be like Michael Michael Phelps. Focus on my own lane. Be like. It took me two years to reprogram my mind to focus on my own lane, uh, and and that's what we use. We, it's in our it's in our culture statement I for the business. My, I say to my kids all the time: worry about yourself, worry about yourself. Michael Phelps, like, one, Michael Phelps. One will say, "Oh, he's not brushing his teeth. Worry about yourself. You brush your teeth. I'm going to do that. Worry about you. Brush your teeth. Don't worry about his <laughs> teeth. Then him, go and brush teeth." Or and and that, that's the philosophy for the business. Like we, it's no point competing against anyone else. Like we, we want to be the best versions of ourselves. We want to build our dreams, build our vision, make that come to life. And so, as long as we focus in on that, and we share that story with people, we we believe, and we've got proof now that that's enough. That takes us forward in life. So that's that's the philosophy that we use. It's a powerful story. One to definitely, uh, definitely think yeah, about. Yeah, it was a, it was a game changer just, for me. Just worry yeah. about yourself. It's right? quite easy though. You look at competition or you see certain people doing really well and you you, you take your eye off your ball for a second. Yeah, yeah. and like you see, you see on Instagram. Family, friends. Anyway. Instagram, so easy. You don't even media. know that you're doing it. You go on Instagram, you see your mates on holiday. Like, oh man, I'm in London. Yeah. It's freezing and raining. They're in wherever. And with the social media era that we're living Mate, in now, proper, and everyone's man. showing their best life as well. Yeah, that's right. Like we, we could do it easily. Like we could go rent Lambos and all that and put crisps on the back of them. <laughs> it's not real, man. It's like yeah, keep it authentic. That, that's we've always we've never lied about anything. Everything we do is real. Most of the time, we film off our phones. Like even the years ago, the music videos that we did, they went so viral. It was <laughs> off my phone. It was mad. On your phone. I think people appreciate that authenticity a lot more as well. They can connect with it. Yeah, I was reading an article recently about how um, some of the accounts on socials that have taken off a lot in the last 
couple of months of 2024. We're only in, Ooh. yeah, we're only a, m- a month or so into yeah. it, right? But the last, uh, the, the ones that have really taken off are uh, apparently is people just showing like their everyday, like boring life. There's a guy that just shows his nine to five. So I'm on the train to work. Uh, I, I've just had some breakfast, stepped out. I'm on my lunch break. I'm on yeah. my way back home. I just want to see what other people are doing. Isn't it? It's yeah, interesting. Yeah. But, but he's consistent about it and mm. his style is the same and yeah. it's fresh. That's, it's odd to say that just showing your regular everyday life is fresh. It can blow up. But that's what people are relating to now because there's so much, you just don't know what to believe out there. You, mm. It's almost like you're craving something normal. Normal and fresh. And being entertained by it. I've we know that. someone who's got a million followers and he's openly told us, I bought them. Oh yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. He's million told followers. us. How yeah. many likes does he get though? Oh, the engagement's awful. Yeah. Like, he goes, oh, it's crap. It's just for when someone looks at my account, they can see I've got a million followers. <laughs> Instantly. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I believe that. I think I've got a friend that's a lawyer and he just posts morning, waking up, having breakfast, right. driving to work, the kind of work in the office and they get millions of views, these right. reels. You know, it's how he compiles it all together yeah. into a nice reel. Yeah. And yeah, it blows up and it's goes crazy, viral. We were talking about that, is, yeah. you know, consistency. Uh, I suppose that's another lesson that we've learned with the business. Like, Mr. Singh's 1.0 version, we were very inconsistent, I think. Like we were doing really cool stuff and then we wouldn't do anything for ages, yeah, then do something cool. Yeah. And again, driven by, oddly, driven by scarcity mindset, we'd try something to make money mm. rather than doing it for the product. If that didn't work, we'd shift to the next thing. If that didn't work, we'd shift to the next thing. We did like pop-ups. We, we tried to do like uh, food Ooh, stores. Food we, we tried to do t-shirts. We, you know, we were like just... Just everywhere yeah and not staying focused not staying consistent whereas obviously it's a, it's a different situation now but it applies to social if someone has got a business and a brand that they're trying to build stay consistent yeah know who their audience is the story they want to tell and stay consistent well, that consistency right? is with anything man like even when i was in property i think the only thing i did different to everyone always used to say to me well, what would you do different why are you so good or why do you make more money i was like i don't know i don't do anything different i just know what I need to do these things every day and not. Mm. That's it. I d- just do that. Just do it every day. Like I was six, six days, seven days a week, whatever it's 16, 17 stone about two years ago. Really? And I always went on diets and done stuff like that. And then I got, a, um, like I did, then I just went, you know, let me just do this for 100 days. Just 100 days. It's not that long. So I did it every day for 100 days. I started running. running I started. So when I first started, I got from my flat to the end of the road, which is 50 steps. Yeah. And I was blowing. But I said, all right, cool, let me just walk around. So I did a walk. Next day, I said, all right, let me get to the tree past it. Did that, then I went for a walk. And then towards the end, I, I was doing half marathons. But I just did it every day. That's all I did. Just done it every day, every day. So there's good, good themes coming out of the like this, this week... Well, no, la- for, since the beginning of the year, I've been at the gym every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Sunday I'll do whatever. This week, Monday, I think I was, something happened on Sunday, so I got up late. I didn't go gym, and I've not been to the gym all week this week because I missed Monday. It's mad, isn't it? And you fall off the wagon just like that. Yeah. So Wednesday, that. Wednesday, I could have gone. I, was like, like, I, I, was like, I didn't go Monday, so I'll allow it. And yeah. then today, I was going to go, and I was like, oh, that means I'll get up at four. So. But before, when I was on it regimented, I would have got up at four. I, w- I did this thing where it was five, five, five. So five days a week at 5 a.m. I'd run a 5K. And I did it consistently. But just because I didn't go Monday this week. Just throws you off track. I had crisps yesterday, loads of crisps. I ain't gonna lie, I enjoyed it though. But. It's business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A yes. great book uh, for anyone that's into listening to books or reading books. I can't remember if you read it or not. Listening doesn't count. You gotta read the book. Oh, yeah, read it, okay. Anyway, this is where we disagree about things. <laughs> I'm right, by the way. Uh, there's a great book called The Compound Effect by mm. a guy called Darren Hardy. Um, I, I listened to it. I read it five times. I read and it. one of the one of the times I was reading it at the same time as well. Um, but that book that's so pointless. What you read it and listened to it at the same time? No, you actually retain more information. I'm right, right. Okay. When you read it and, and listen yeah, to so it. Yeah, so if you uh, listen to a book, the yeah. guy's narrating the book and you're reading it at the same time, ah, you actually to. consume, because you, you learn in three different ways. Um, verbally, acoustically, and the last one is by doing. I can't remember what the R stands for, um, but you, that's how you learn. So by reading the book, you're, you're doing it, you're, reading, you're seeing it and you're hearing it. So you're retaining as much information as you can. 
Uh, but going back to the book, The Compound Effect, Darren Hardy, one of the key concepts he talks about is the power of compounding results. So like he's saying, you, you're building over time. So he might have done 50 meters, then he's done 60, then he's done 70, then he's done 80 every day for 100 days. But if you th add that up over 100 days, he might have ended up doing 50 miles if you add all the numbers up. So compounding, he's making so much benefit. He's getting health benefits. His bones are getting stronger day by day. You, it's like compound interest in business, right? Money on top of money makes more money, then makes more money, then makes more money. And it's the same with anything that you apply yourself to, especially in business. Um, and then there's something else called momentum. And he tells a great story about, you it's know, chapter, chapter four, Big Mo. Yeah, Big Mo. Yeah, Big yeah, Mo. Big Mo. Uh, so if you know anyone that's called Mo, shout them out, right? Big okay, Mo. I know a few Mo's. Yeah. You know a few yeah, Mo's, yeah? yeah? Okay, big up, Big yeah, Mo. That, that chapter is, is the game changer life chapter. Changing, man. Uh, okay. So there's a little story he tells about, um, you know, in, in like kids' parks, they've got the, uh, the merry-go-round. Yeah. Yeah, so you stand on it, you have to push it, and then it gets going, right? Okay. Is it called merry-go-round? It's a roundabout. Roundabout, roundabout, roundabout sorry, one, not yeah. merry-go-round. That's something else. <laughs> roundabout. Sounds like a club, isn't it? Uh, no, the roundabout, the roundabout, right? So imagine a roundabout, and but there's 10 people on the roundabout. How much effort is it going to take for you to get that roundabout moving? It's a lot more effort. A lot of effort, right? But once it gets moving, and it's really spinning, how much effort does it take to keep that roundabout moving? It's a lot less, I think. Just yeah, because do like you're just one doing kick, one, kick, uh, one kick, one kick, yeah. one kick, and it keeps spinning. Because yeah. the momentum is keeping it going. Right. If you stop, what happens? And then it'll be a lot harder. Yeah. A lot harder to start up again. What do most people do? Let's take fitness as an example. You go through the hard work of building up the momentum, and then you stop. Yeah. You have to start again. You have to start the merry go uh, the the roundabout again, right? So, when I read that, I was like. Mm. I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> start, stop, start, yeah. stop. Start, stop, start, stop. Like. Start, stop with my business. Start, stop with campaigns. Start, stop with fitness. Every start, life, stop with everything, food. Man. Life. Everything, man. I've done it with this podcast. Though. You just got a few more episodes now. But yeah, you start, you get that momentum and then yeah. you just stop. Life gets in the way. Yeah. 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 But that yeah. is life though, isn't it? Like, and then there's, a, there's another life. book. Uh, you talk about life getting in the way. A fantastic book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Book, yeah. Phenomenal book. And you talk about habit stacking and how you know, the habits that you have shape your life and your future. And this whole thing about compounding effort and momentum and the habits that you have, they, they are what carry you through because your willpower, you run out of willpower. Your motivation, you run out of motivation. Like we all have days, I don't want to do sales today. I don't want to do, I just don't want to get out of bed today. Just I don't want to play Call of Duty all day. Uh, yeah, I just it. want to play Call of Duty all day. Whatever, you, we all have those days, right? Let's be honest. Like regardless of how, who you are, I haven't met anyone that is hyper successful that doesn't have those days but i think the difference is they still turn up they still turn up and do at least the basics in their checklist if their thing is i'm gonna make three sales phone calls they will make three f sales phone calls but they'll hate it but they'll do the three sales phone calls yeah. and guess what at the end of the week they've made 15 sales phone calls and they'll get a deal out of it and that's the difference is this com is the habits, the compounding, the momentum, uh, and like you know, everyone learns is fortunate enough to learn this at different points in their life if they're into it and they want to learn about these things. Some people they learn it early on, like because their families like their their parents are like that, their friends are like that. Others like like me, like us, we have to go out and try and learn these things and like through books and through people that you meet. So that, that's like kind of been some journey. good words of advice and a few books for our listeners that they can uh, can read as oh, well. Oh yeah, yeah send, send those, DMs, man. send DMs. I've got I've got countless books that I, yeah. I can recommend the, the on the Chimp Paradox. Oh, phenomenal book. Chimp Paradox. I've heard of that. One. I think I've got start that. With why. Start with why. Start with why. Mate, there's. Have you heard of Simon Sinek? Start with why. I'm not not heard of that one. No. If you just watch the YouTube video, it's an 18 minute TED talk that this guy does. Start with why. It's about, it's called the Golden Circle, um, and. What this guy's done is, the reason it's so genius is if you, the way he describes it, if you look top down at the human brain, in the middle of it is the emotional center, is the cerebral, I can't remember what it's the called. Cerebral. I don't know what it Something. is, but the most emo emotional part is right in the middle of your brain. And then you've got the slightly more logical part that's around that. And then the third circle is the most logical part. Now we as humans, we make decisions based on emotion, but we justify them with logic, 
right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what he says is most businesses, they start by telling people what they do, right? So if if we were doing it in that way with our crisps, the first thing we'd say when they say, tell us what you do, we'd be like, we sell crisps, right? Yeah. But actually we start our story by saying we're a family business and this is our story. And we we make our products because we want to bring people together. That's our why. That's a more of an emotional connection with how you sell your product. And what this guy does is he teaches you how to do that. He teaches you the difference between how to sell on the why versus on the what. So it's why you're doing what you're doing, how you do it, and what you do. So another great example is if you look at the ads between uh, Apple products and any other Android product, most other Android products, when they do their adverts, what do they talk about? Like the galaxies and all these features. Features. And, yeah. New, like, 3 million megapixel camera, like, 82 zoom, like, 58P processor. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, what yeah, that means. No, I'm making this yeah, up. Yeah, but no it, one knows what that is, do it, they? It yeah. could, I mean, it could be real. I'm making that up. Okay. But it sounds like the type of things that they talk about. What does Apple do when they run their adverts? I'm not watching it. To show you a white wire with some headphones on it. What do they, they, they might have, I remember the FaceTime one when they, look, when they first started talking about FaceTime, they had these grandparents and they had like part of the grandparents' face because they didn't know how it worked. And then the grandkid on the other end saying, uh, happy birthday, grandma, happy birthday. And they're just talking between the phone. And then there's a scene of like a, a soldier who's on deployment talking to his kid, same like to his wife, sorry a couple of friends that are talking to each other using FaceTime and all the advert then ends with is FaceTime by Apple. Yeah. Right? Everyone can relate to that. Everyone can relate to their grandparent getting on the phone and like FaceTiming you like this and seeing up their nostrils, <laughs> right? Or some, some silly little example like that. And so that's by selling on emotion. Whereas when you see like a technical spec of a product, that's what the product does. It's a completely different way of selling. So... Yeah, that's what that book is all about. Simon Sinek, Start With Why. There's a TED Talk that he does, 18 minutes on YouTube that you guys can watch. I'll have to give it a watch. A few people have said, yeah, when you're trying to sell, you're trying to sell it with emotion as yeah, opposed to the just why. sell the product, yeah. Like your, your suits business, right? Like people, why are people buying your suits? Why? It's the feeling that they get, how they look. Right, um, it's the feeling, right? You yeah, feel even... special, a bespoke suit for your wedding day, for your big occasion. You make people feel very special. That's, that's, what, that's is, why yeah. they spend that's thousands what, of pounds with you that's what they do yeah our brand motto to be fair is where luxury becomes a lifestyle so we're trying okay. to go down the lifestyle brand yeah there you go as right as opposed to just the f product itself yeah 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 so, so yeah. it's about yeah it's about emotions that's it people are going to buy from people they like and want to be yeah business the ceo club that's, that's it, related yeah. to it so it all links together yeah exactly so one of the things i was going to ask you is mr sings that sounds like a generic name i just want to talk to you about the the sort of name, the IP, the copyrights, is it you exclusively that have the rights to that yeah. name? And uh, just dive into that a little bit if you so can. Singh is the middle name of every Sikh male. Yeah. Could be females as well. And Kaur is the is the female, right? It means e like, everyone. Every Sikh. Every Sikh. Uh, Singh is male. Kaur is for the female. So we shouldn't actually even have like a, a surname after that. It should be uh like Guldeep Singh, Ravdeep Singh, that's it. So every every Sikh's meant to be the same, there's no caste, there's no anything it's, else. It's so for equality. Yeah. Everyone's on the same level, that should be your name. And we get a lot about you guys don't wear turbans from from people saying you're using the, the Sikh symbol as your as your logo. But our, our dad does. And my, my parents wanted us to do it. We chose not to do it. Not just us, like millions of others. We haven't done it. But I think that's another real thing like we could we could have lied and made that different but we haven't this okay. is us we are british asians we're like my kids are the, what third generation like mm. we were born and raised in east london man yeah but like, this is how we are this is our brand it's our family name and we're proud of yeah. it yeah yeah our belief has always been look whether you're muslim christian jew sikh whatever there's people that call themselves that religion but you know how they act yeah Right and conduct themselves on a day-to-day -day basis is almost the complete opposite of what they claim to be, the way they think, their mindset, all of those things. Our belief, that as in our family, as in us guys, is that how we conduct ourselves and how we are as humans, how we love one another, love other people, 
do our best to live without any judgment, to serve, serve our, serving other people, that's the most important thing to us. And so by virtue of that, we proudly use the name. Now, going back to your question about how do you protect something like that, like a, a name like Mr. Singh, which is millions of people have the same name. I remember when we first raised money for the company, I met the IP lawyer and he, he taught me like a little story that really stuck with me. He said, imagine your brand is like a flag and you plant that flag in the ground. Now, every single activity that you do after that, which uses your brand, puts a little circle around your flag. Now, over time, the more exposure you get, the more customers, the more you tell your story, the more your brand is associated to everything that you're doing, you're adding more and more circles and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger around your flag. Now, if someone else comes along and wants to challenge that, it's going to be very difficult for them to challenge that because you've got so many circles around your flag and in the courts of law and with the, uh, the IP office, so it's registered with the government, they're going to look at that and go, no, this IP belongs to this company because of that reason. And we were fortunate that when we first launched the business, we registered the IP. No one else had done it. We were very lucky. No one had registered Mr. Sings with this logo and we, we got it. So now if someone tries to register Mr. Sings, we get notified and we can say, no, we don't want them to have that name. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's other companies that have Mr. Sings in their name, but we've actually not stopped anyone. As long as it's not in direct conflict with what we're doing, they might be doing like a restaurant or a pizza or a building company. We're like, well, well look, it's your name as well. But from a business and branding perspective, there's no conflict. We're in this business. You guys are in that industry. It's totally cool. So that's how you build your protection around your brand. I love that. That's clever. And yeah. uh, for the Mr. Singh's brand, um, what would you say the future is uh, for listeners that maybe want to reach out to you? How can they reach out to you? And what are the plans going forward then? Because from everything I've heard in this podcast, you've, it's been one hell of a journey. Yeah, yes. It's been a, it's been a mad one, man. It's been over 10 years. Life-changing. Like, we've grown up with this. It's, it's part of the family, man. It's like part of us. Um, I think the best way to connect with us, uh, social media, social media. So at Mr. Sings LDN, um, mine personal is at Cook Sahota. Your one at Mr. Sings LDN at Mr. Sings LDN. Um, and yeah, they can connect with us there. Um, sign up on, on the website. Yeah. Pre-orders. We're going to start taking pre-orders like today. Um, just, just, it's going to be sign up registrations. So hopefully we get all this HSBC stuff yeah. sorted. Yeah, and then gross. and then the plan is is ready to go man we just got like genuine our vision is genuine world domination it's like it's written to be the number one snack brand in the country untouchable by any of our competition that is the vision that we've got a like hundred million pound business is what we're aiming for yeah uh, next stage is a uh, five million pound valuation for the company and that's that's what we're aiming for mm. now um, and we've really i mean not even aiming for the work's already begun to to deliver that to, to deliver that first goal and to get it to five million, uh, five million uh, valuation is yeah. that just by sales then, or uh, not only by sales, but it's essentially um, proving that our blueprint works right. and the model that we've got works. Because essentially, what we want to want to be able to show people, investors in particular, is that look for every pound that you put in, we are going to get three uh, x, two x, five x return on that pound invested in marketing, in team building, in systems and processes, in leveraging AI. We, you know, but you can only do that by proving your blueprint, um, and that's how the valuations will increase. And then, obviously, the ability to grab market share will become a part of that. But remember, this is a, a billion pound, billion pound plus business, and in the UK, especially, we love crisps. It's not going anywhere. No, uh, I, I appreciate people are getting healthier and all this other stuff, but we still love crisps. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're, the, it's a, it's a fun thing to be doing. Is there a healthy element to this? No, or? no, it's a no. crisp, man. It's, it's, it's crisp. to be enjoyed. It's proper. a snack. It's, you know, it's, no, it's low, deep fried no, and crunchy. No calorie version coming out anytime. No, soon. no, no, no. If you're going to yeah. eat crisps, man, eat crisps. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy <laughs> it. Enjoy them, man. Loosen your pants and just eat crisps. Like, that's, that's what it's yeah, all I about. I love that. I love that. That's it. It's authentic. Yeah. So, yeah, no, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. No, likewise. I want to conclude on, uh, just give some advice to our listeners. I know you've given loads of advice anyway. But there's a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to our podcast, people that are starting businesses, mm -hmm. running businesses uh, that probably haven't uh, been through half of what you've been through. Yeah. And I know you guys have got a lot of experience and everything that you've been through. So what kind of advice would you give to people when it comes to individuals that want to start up businesses? 
My mind's really about you, you as the person, not about the businessman. Like, look after yourself, your your me- your mental health, because you can get into some really dark, horrible places. Mm, yeah, that's it for me, man. Look after yourself. Uh, I will share an analogy with you, and it's this. So let's imagine you're in a car and you're using your sat nav. So let's say Google Maps. The first thing that you're going to do is put your postcode in the sat nav. Google Maps is going to throw up a route. And you'll set off on that route. It will tell you how long it's going to take you to get there. If there's traffic, um, it will show you estimated time of arrival. Now, let's say you're on that route, but you decide to pull over and grab a coffee. You've gone off route. When you set off again, you're going to get rerouted and end up in that same place that you put into the, the sat-nav. Now, the reason I'm sharing this analogy is because the postcode in the sat-nav is like the goal for your business. What would happen if there's no postcode in the sat-nav? Where would you end up? Just nowhere. Hoping for the best and getting lost. Most people, myself included, when we started this, there was no postcode in the sat-nav. So I would recommend you start there. Put a postcode in your sat-nav. Know where you want to be, even in three months. If you don't know, if you can't think five years into the future, where do you want to be in three months? A year. What's your ideal situation? And be kind to yourself, you know. Give yourself, uh, you know, grace to say that, look, I am still learning. Be honest. Put that postcode in the sat-nav and then go for it. I love that analogy. Yeah. That's a good way to end the podcast. I think there's some great themes that have come out of the podcast. A lot to learn from you two individuals. Can't believe how fast two and a half hours is. I know, oh, oh, mate. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. Thank you for traveling all the way from uh, from London. It's a long journey. No, we're grateful, honestly. Yeah. So grateful no, that you, you've it. had us here and, and you wanted us on on this on this show with you and to speak with you as well and so it means a lot to us we're really grateful now i'm looking forward to seeing where mr sings goes uh it'll be interesting. well we'll get some up to you when uh when we well, finally start production arrives, yeah. we'll shop for some suits will you yeah definitely <laughs> oh yeah if you need some male models you know like we've got a fresh trim yeah. today and everything so we'll uh, we can do a little exchange yeah, yeah i'm ready how many crisps can us the bespoke suit get <laughs> we'll negotiate yeah, afterwards. Yeah, happy happy um and uh will you have any uh, any of these in yorkshire for our uh, customers that are listening maybe we've got a lot there, of there will listeners be from Yorkshire or is it just basically ordering off your website and gets delivered UK yeah nationwide delivery on okay. the website uh, Mr. Sings online is pre-registering just with an email address at the moment right. we will have uh, like shops and places like yeah. that distributing uh, hopefully in the summer okay. yeah. but first and foremost it's going to be on, on the website and um, we'll take it from there all, right. the, all the announcements are going to come out on Mr. Sings I tried Sings to get on your here. website and it's got like some password or something it was saying I think it was uh it was saying sign up or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's it. Just sign up for pre-reg at the moment. Is that what it is? That's yeah, it's it just a sign up, moment. email address, sign up at the moment. That's Otherwise, nice. just connect on the socials, stay in contact with us, um, say hello, yeah. um, anything like that. And then that's where we put everything out. Show the love to their new podcast as well. Is there a way to get to your podcast? That would yeah, be so we're, we're recording them at the moment. We're going to start dropping them in time. Um, they'll be on the youtube channel again it's going to be on youtube or mr at mr sings london ld no sorry mr sings ldn um all the everything will be on our social media as well i'll tag it all in the the bio of the podcast as well and then uh, i think uh in the next few years to come we're definitely going to do follow-ups with all our guests that featured on our show to see how things are going so it'll be really interesting to see how how the business progresses and what's what's happened over the last uh, the next few years so that sounds good thank you for coming down i really appreciate and uh listeners thank you for listening uh please like subscribe comment and uh, if you like these guests reach out to them and uh, keep an eye out for the next episode peace peace